Divine Truth. Name of this presentation is Pseudo-Spirituality, and it is part of the Human Soul series. It was presented in Sydney, New South Wales, Australia, on the 9th of June, 2012. This is part one. Just make sure our cameras are rolling. What we want to do first is explain to you what we do with the camera material. And um, all of the camera material and the recording material that we have um, goes on the internet, on YouTube. If you don't want to have your face on YouTube or on the internet or your voice, then um, there's little we can do about it except for asking you to leave. <laughs> because it's very, very hard with the camera shots to actually you know, avoid a person and so forth. So, so we'd just like you to be aware that uh, those things will be happening. We do that for free, so that every person who wants to watch the material around the world gets a chance to watch the material. And, uh, but we can't guarantee how other people will use the material. So if you're... Uh, because we do everything we do for free, other people often get the data or the material and then change it and manipulate it for television or whatever. And so quite often it gets distorted. So we can't uh, guarantee that your words won't get distorted in the process. If you feel confronted by that, um, my suggestion is to maybe not attend one of our events and just watch it on YouTube after it's happened. That being said, uh, what we find is that often your questions benefit uh, other people quite a lot. And many people around the world comment how the, the questions of people in the audience have helped them personally so much. So um, if you're brave enough to ask questions and have your face in the camera while you're doing so, because basically Lena there is the audience camera operator, and you can see she was just pointed at anybody who's asking the question. And that way we get a video and an audio of the person that we can then hear later on in the presentations. Now today's uh, format is probably going to be a little different than we're used to doing. Uh, how many of you have not been along to an event before that we've held? So a few of you. No worries. Welcome. Welcome. Um, it's lovely to meet you for, for the first time. Um, my, I, I suppose we should introduce ourselves to yourselves. Um, so I'm, I'm Alan Miller. This is Mary Luck. Um, Hi. It's a lovely last name, isn't it? Luck. <laughs> <laughs> so lucky. Um, and uh, I, I'm Jesus and Mary's Mary Magdalene. Um, now, those uh, claims that we're making, which we're not, we don't enforce anybody in the group to, to believe or understand, um, but we have been presenting a lot of information over a period now of, well, for myself, nearly, nearly nine years now, um, that are all to do with what I call divine truth. We don't expect anybody to donate any money to us. We do not expect anybody to um, even be involved in the pre presentation when they're here. But we do have a donation box up the back if you wish to donate some money. Everything that we do is for free. But obviously, you know, these venues cost money and the sound equipment costs money. Also, the people who are helping us are all volunteering their time for free as well. So um, this is something we do as a gift to, to everyone um, when we're travelling. So, is there any questions you'd like to ask about that first, before we proceed on the subject I would like to discuss with you today? Um, is there any specific questions? I know there are lots and lots of material on YouTube, and perhaps what we could do is just list the YouTube. If you, if you go onto YouTube, um, most of you probably know how to do that, being... Um, in the computer age. In the computer age, yes. Um, there's a channel called Divine Truth Channel. If you just type that as a search in YouTube, you will actually get a list of around about 200 videos or so that we've put on YouTube. And most of the videos are two hours long or longer. So there's nearly 400 hours or so of material on YouTube. So which one do you go to first is the first question that most people ask. Well, I've created on YouTube a, a series. If you look at the playlists, if you select playlists, there's a series called Welcome Series. And my suggestion is to actually watch those series of videos first because that, uh, that 
some of it contains an interview of myself and Mary by different people. Some of it contains some of the talks that we've taught, where, where we give a skeleton of the universe, like a, the, the secret, we call it the secrets of the universe, the, the entire way the universe operates. Um, and that's all contained within the welcome series of talks. So my suggestion is to have a look at those series of talks first before you look at anything else. Um, we also have a website uh, which is called Uh, uh, com. I'm updating this site next week or the week after with new material. Um, the new website that I'm updating will have uh, a welcome page right at the start. Uh, so anybody who's new can just click on links that will sort of explain things to you a little. And we also have a What's New page for the people who have regular visitors that can go to the What's New page and see what's been new, newly uploaded. There are links on that side to site to the YouTube site, so so that way you, you can find the videos that way. There are also audios you can download and listen to via MP3, and uh, there are also PDF documents that you can download and and read if if you wish. There are also books on the site. Some of them haven't been published for nearly a hundred years; they were written a hundred years or so ago. That are very interesting books that you can also download on the site. We also now have two free services that we offer um, to anybody as well. Um, we have uh, little, what are called 16 gigabyte, um, what would you call them, memory sticks um, that can plug into a computer. Those 16 gigabyte memory sticks can load around 10 videos on them or um, they can load all of our audio and all of our printed data on them along with some videos. And we send them out free to, to anybody who requests them. So you can actually email our office, and uh, which the email address is office at vinetruth.com. And there'll be a listing of all of the talks that are available on the new website, won't there? Yes. So you can read through there and think, I'd like to hear that or see that and, and just email and request that and we'll send it out to you. Yep. Now, if you would like absolutely everything that's on our website, you can also that's also an option. So that's, that's every single video we've ever done, made at this point and or every single audio we've ever made and every single PDF document that's on the website as well. Um, and in fact, you, in, the, in the future, you'll be able to have the website itself as well on, on a disk. And so all that you need to do there is send a 500 gigabyte disk to our address and we will populate that disk with everything that we've got and then uh, send that disk back to you. So that's also a service that we offer to everyone. If uh, all of you with mobile phones, if you could make sure they're on silent or off, that would be fantastic so that everyone doesn't get interrupted with our talk today. Are there any questions about all of that? Um, now, all of that information is on the new website, but it's not on the current website. And the new website will be uh, loaded probably next week sometime or the week after. So um, it will all be available on that site. I think that's the main things. So if you're new to, um, to ever coming along to one of our seminars, my, our suggestion is to watch the Divine Truth Channel Welcome Series on YouTube and, and that'll give you a very good background as to whether you want to investigate more or, or not. Um, and we're happy to send out the Welcome Series on a memory stick for, for all of you who have a computer that you can just plug into your computer and watch. With all of our material, it's all without copyright. So uh, when I say without copyright, obviously we hold the copyright to it, but it's all for free and can be distributed for free. So that means that uh, everything that we produce that you get, if you, if you want to share it with somebody else, it's just a matter of copying it and sharing it with somebody else if that's what you want to do. So that's how we operate with everything. So the question then becomes how do Mary and I survive, <laughs> I suppose? <laughs> And how we survive is on, uh, basically, uh, a lot of people have really enjoyed the material that has been produced. And they just donate some funds to us, whatever they can. And we live off of those funds as well as uh, travel around and do these kind of talks. And those funds pay for the venue hire. They also, it also pays for our personal 
expenses and also our living expenses. We live quite cheaply, but it pays for our expenses. Um, and that's basically how we live. So we, we still pay taxation on all of the donations we receive. So, so we do pay taxation on every donation we receive. But, we, uh, but our, after taxation, the way we operate is because we generally spend everything that we receive. <laughs> There's not very much taxation that we have to pay in the long run. Um, we spend a lot of, uh, of our, the money we receive just in redistributing divine truth. So we don't actually hold on to the funds uh, very much at all. And, uh, and in fact, the, reason, the only reason why we can travel around and also travel overseas at times um, is because of the generous donations of different people that help us to do those kind of things. So that's, that's how we function and that's how we live. Would you like to ask any questions about that before we proceed? No? Everyone's fine with that? And everyone's okay with the fact that you're going to be on the internet at some point? <laughs> <laughs> not, not so fine with that. It's, um, we find that uh, doing this is, is a really incredible experience for ourselves because we get to meet lots and lots of people who are interested in spirituality. And in fact, one of the, talks, one of the things we'd like to discuss with you today is spirituality itself as a concept. Um, and what we would like to separate forms of spirituality into. So we'll just uh, do that. Just rub these details off and present the subject we're going to discuss today. Is that... Um... The blue is not much good for getting off. Okay. And is, do you want a different uh, mark eraser? I'm going to have to ditch my earrings, aren't I? Just one. <laughs> There's a better one. Most of this off. No, it can't be true. <laughs> Mary often wears these long earrings, Big earrings and the, when no. it comes to the sound system, it's not very Doesn't good. Work. So um, the series of talks, the talk we'd like to give today, if, with your permission, is part of the Human Soul series of talks. You'll see when you have a look on YouTube, we've created a series of talks called The Human Soul. And this is a part of one. And we'd like today to call the talk Pseudo-Spirituality. And tomorrow we'd like to call our talk True Spirituality. And we thought the best way to present the material, because there are, are, is a lot of material that we'd like to present, is to first Mary will interview me about the subject. And then, so we'll catch that on video. And then what we'd like to do is open it up to the, to the audience uh, in the second half of our session today, where you just barrage us with questions, if that's okay with you, that you have about the topic, pseudo-spirituality. Um, but we also thought that if you do have any questions while we're doing the interview, we'll try to catch... If you put your hand up, we'll try to catch your questions through it. But could you make sure the question is specifically on the subject that we're discussing at the time? Because that way it's a lot easier for people who are listening to the discussion and, or, or watching it f to follow the discussion. If you ask a question that's way off topic, obviously uh, the whole audience gets to be way off topic. So if you could just bear that in mind. So that's our topic today that we'd like to discuss. Everyone fine with that? Okay. So let's begin. <laughs> Everyone's very quiet. Aren't they? <laughs> You're shy, eh? Is that how it is? No? All right. Well, um, I've got some notes here that um, that we've talked about beforehand, and so I'm just going to kind of guide our. I'm going to ask AJ some questions and guide our discussion through the topic, mm. making sure we don't forget anything or miss anything. So, um, we had an alternate title for this talk. Do you remember what it was? 
Um, I can't quite remember. I think it's something to do with fake spirituality. It was it? Beware of Spiritual Claptrap. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> beware of Spiritual Claptrap, yeah. yeah. Because we, we feel quite strongly that uh, there are a lot of forms of spirituality on the planet today which, which seem like spirituality, but, but in reality um, don't really have much of an, a positive effect on humanity. Like if you look at a lot of forms of uh, spirituality historically... You can see that historically, um, spirituality, ha so-called spirituality, has often caused a lot of damage to the planet and damage to humankind. You know, a lot of wars have been caused by people who say that they're spiritual or that they're interested in God. And a lot of uh, pain and suffering has been the result of those particular conflicts. We also see in families and in terms of uh, society, there is often quite a lot of heavy projection at the next generation of society to remain in the same place that the previous generation is in. And many of that, much of that pressure comes from religious pressure, like to, to follow the same religion as your dad or mum followed, to, to follow the same belief systems that your dad and mum had. And so we, we sort of see that there's whole forms of spirituality on the planet that are actually preventing the planet from progressing forward. If you look all through the Dark Ages, there's whole forms of spirituality that stop the planet from progressing forward with regard to the investigation of science. Many people who were, who were scientifically inclined were, were placed in prison for most of their life, in fact, um, because of their investigations that conflicted with the different so-called spiritual views at the time. And we see this kind of forms of spirituality as, as quite damaging to society, quite damaging to the long-term benefit of society's progression. So that's why we've called it uh, spiritual <laughs> claptrap. <laughs> and obviously from what you're saying, there's a lot of that kind of spirituality existent in our lives, even in our core belief systems, yeah. if, even if we're not aware of it. So for that reason, when we present this material, it's possible that people will um, go through a series of emotions to... Could yes, so I, I find that? a lot of times when we present material that's a little confronting, there's usually denial initially that say, says, oh, well, it's not that bad, you know, things are not, that, not much of a problem and we have not that many problems on earth with regard to this particular issue. The reality is that religious opposition and persecution are still one of the primary motivations of pain and suffering on the earth. They're one of the primary creators of pain and suffering on the earth. And so from my perspective, I sort of see denial as a very dangerous uh, point of view because if we stay in denial about what's actually happening on the earth and what its underlying causes are, we don't ever have a chance to change it. We don't ever have a chance to grow. So, so I feel denial is... Yeah. We, we, we need to stay away from denial, really. Yeah. And it's true, isn't it, as well, that there's many spirits who are invested in us staying the same and they can keep us in a state of denial, can't yeah, they? Yes. So yeah. uh, uh, many people don't realise initially, perhaps, but many people, when they pass over into the spirit world, they hold on to their same set of belief systems that they had on the earth. But not only do they hold on to those belief systems, they also then try to enforce or push those belief systems upon people on earth from the spirit world. And so you have a whole groups of spirits in the spirit world. There are literally, there's around 22 billion spirits in the spirit world that are earth bound. Uh, in other words, they still surround the earth and influence what happens on the earth to a large extent. And these spirits have a large impact upon the belief systems and, and how fast we change our beliefs on the earth. Because if you've got a whole heap of people around you who are trying to force you into having exactly the same belief as you currently have, then it, there, that's a lot of pressure to, to not change. So, and this is what societally has happened over many, many centuries, is that even during the, like I said, during the Dark Ages, you had all of these religious spirits who were in the spirit world who were oppressing the scientists, trying to prevent the scientists from investigating any forms of scientific truth because they felt that it would come in some way come in opposition with their religious beliefs. So, so they oppress and cause other people to oppress those particular individuals. And so, yes, there is quite a large amount of spirit influence as well to prevent us from um, examining true spirituality versus 
living in this pseudo spiritual belief system that that is actually damaging not only to ourselves but also to society. Yeah, yeah. So there's a question already. Yeah. Uh, if you just use the microphone when you ask the question, if I could demonstrate the mic, if you just hold it up like that, that's so good. that way, yes. that's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, um, question, please, on what you just said. It occurred to me as you were speaking, I've always thought of spirit as being a one-to-one attachment. Spirit will talk to me. Another spirit would talk to me. Yep. And there's people that are trapped. And from what you're saying, they're pretty much holding on to their beliefs. And I'm thinking, well... If the Pope died, would he try and organise a whole bunch of bishops to act on us? In other words, are they individuals on that side or do they tend to create groups at that level to control us? Well, many of the spirits who... You've got to remember when a person passes over that they actually don't change their belief systems very much at all. So, so for the majority of people, they retain exactly the belief systems that they had on Earth... And the only difference is they know that they have passed generally. And even that's not sometimes true because you, oh, I have talked to spirits who are not even aware that they've passed yet. But most of them know that they've passed and so they know they're now in a different uh, dimensional existence, if you could call it that. But, but they have exactly the same belief systems and exactly the same purpose, exactly the same skills, exactly the same injured state as well. And so if their desire on earth is to control large groups of people into a certain form of religion, then their desire once they pass into the spirit world will remain exactly the same as that. So they will still want to control large groups of people on earth and in the spirit world into that religion. So I've actually had conversations with spirits in the spirit world where, um, and many of them have been organisers of religion on earth when they lived on earth, and they're still trying to organise the same religion in the spirit world and they have groups of spirits surrounding them who they try to keep under control with the same sets of beliefs, and they are still trying to influence people on earth with the same set of beliefs. And this is one of the impediments to our humanity growing. If, if, if we're going to grow as a, as a race, we need to have people who are willing to investigate all forms of scientific endeavour not just the forms of scientific endeavour that certain religions approve of or certain types of uh, belief systems approve of. We need to be able to have the freedom to use our will in a loving manner to investigate everything. Mm -hmm. And when we receive oppression, it uh, is very, very very hard for us to then investigate things in a loving manner because we feel like we're going to get attacked and we're often afraid of being attacked and so therefore we shut down and we don't investigate. So I feel it's one of the main impediments, actually, of humanity changing and society changing into a more loving society. Having all of these groups organised in the spirit world, in the, low, in the lower areas of the spirit world, they're not developed in love yet, and they are all still trying to maintain their control systems on the earth in the same manner they were when they lived on earth. And, um, and the problem with that is that many people on earth feel very oppressed because of, the, of that. Thank you very much for that. That's a great answer. Yep. Um, one of the thoughts I have is, if an individual acts upon me, it's my energy against theirs. Am I now fighting um, a collated group? Is their power as a group of people on me much greater than an individual in spirit? Yes, well, the, the short answer to that, I suppose, is yes. Um, obviously, whenever a group of people act upon an individual the individual feels their, the group's power is stronger than their own. So if you think about it on Earth, if you had a group of people all attacking you and saying you're doing the wrong thing, there's a higher likelihood of the average person just acceding to their will rather than, rather than following their own will because of the potential for attack and, and abuse. And in the spirit world, there are groups of spirits who do the same thing. They sort of gang up on a person and try to influence that person down a certain path. Now, the only exception to that is when, and this is one thing we'd like to discuss about real spirituality tomorrow, is that when we're in a state of love and truth and humility ourselves, it's very, very hard for even a group of people to have a powerful influence over us as an individual. And if you, if you look historically at people who stand out in society over, over the last few thousand years, if you look at the people who've stood out in society, they've always been individuals who can cope with attack without changing their loving stance. 
So you look at, like, for instance, in, our, in, in the last century, you look at ones like Gandhi, for example, is a standout sort of individual. And you can see that even though he was attacked by society, attacked by polit politicians and, and placed in prison on many occasions, um, he didn't change the way he acted because he was in a state of love and truth and humility himself. And so that then, even though other people around him acted in certain ways, it didn't really affect him or change him into changing his position or opinions. And, and this, is, this is the mark of a person who has courage enough to face their fears and still present the truth. And that's what, in the end, I feel all of us need to be. We all need to be that. Now, if we are all that, if we are a person who has courage for truth, courage to stay in a place of love, then it is very, very hard for any particular individual here on earth or in the spirit world to affect us negatively. Yeah. And so my recommendation is to always get into a stronger state of truth and love and humility yourself. Once you do that, it is very, very hard for individuals either on earth or in the spirit world to negatively influence you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Okay. Just be, so before we launch into what is pseudo-spirituality, um, just some other emotions that might come up for people because obviously we might be challenging some beliefs that they hold quite dearly. Yeah. Um, well, most of the time when a, a belief is challenged, the first uh, set of ideas that, or, or, or feelings that a person might have is denial, the denial type of feeling. So the other type of feelings that are, oh, I can't believe that's true, no, I don't think that's possible, without any investigation of whether it's true or not. And, and also sometimes a disengagement or a condescension. Yeah, kind, yeah. yeah so a condescending feeling yeah. is a way of protecting your own fear, if yeah. you like. Then uh, oftentimes uh, we get angry as well. So anger is an indication that there is some fear underneath about that particular subject. And quite often when you're challenging belief systems, the fear is, oh, I've spent 20 years formulating that belief system and now you're telling me that there's something wrong with it. Well, that's very difficult to face. And so for the majority of people, they have a tendency to uh, feel angry at first yeah. rather than face their fear that maybe their belief system does, does have some logical issues with it or emotional issues with it that needs to be addressed. Yeah. Um, there may also at some point be sort of some kind of um, grief that is associated with those particular things because if you've spent 20 years or 10 years of your life investigating all forms of, of belief systems and you've now you know, followed that to a point where you now are at a point where you feel fairly solid in your belief systems and all of a sudden somebody come, something coming, coming along calling himself Jesus uh, is confronting you on a lot of levels, just the fact that he's calling himself that, but also, but, but also the fact that he's presenting some things that, that feel quite confronting. Um, that often results in a bit of anger and a bit of fear. Yeah. And, uh, and hence uh, the, a feeling inside of a desire to attack. Now, now obviously in our seminars, as, as you know, Mary, um, and I don't know if the rest of the group knows, but um, generally we don't allow people who are angry with us to remain in our audience for too long, um, which, is, which is an issue of love of ourselves. Um, we do all of these things for free, so we don't feel it's fair that we then get attacked by somebody who's coming along sitting in a seat that we've paid for actually, or other people have paid for for them, um, and then attacking us. But we do feel that sincere questioning and uh, is a very, very good thing. So, so feel we do need to question. Yes. And we hope that our audience allows yeah. that yeah. inside of themselves as well. It allows you, allow yourself the ability to question. And, and don't worry about uh, whether you, you feel like you were wrong or right or any of those kind of things. If we just share the questions, often lots of people, not only in the audience but also in the world, benefit from the questions. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay then. So can we just then contrast what is this idea of true spirituality versus pseudo-spirituality? All right, well, I, I would say true spirituality is the kind of spirituality that changes our heart and causes us to become more loving, more truthful and more humble in all of our interactions in our day-to-day -day life. And in addition to that, causes us to be able to connect with God mm -hmm. and receive love from God in such a way that it transforms the soul, but not only transforms the soul one, like just in one moment in time, 
but also transforms the soul continuously for the rest of our existence. So in other words, it has this infinite, infinite uh, character or nature to it. Uh, true spirituality allows us to continually change, continually evolve into a better being. Yep. In, in terms of, and, and if I define better as a person who's more loving, more truthful, more humble, easier to get along with, more joyous, more <laughs> happier with their day-to-day life, happier in their relationships, uh, that's true spirituality. And any form of investigation that enables that, I feel, is a part of true spirituality. Um, let's contrast that with pseudo-spirituality. Yeah. Pseudo-spirituality is... The spirituality you have when you don't have real spirituality. <laughs> what is that? The, uh, <laughs> Clay, the what Clayton, do we call it in Clayton Australia? Spirituality. Clayton spirituality. <laughs> um, it's the kind of spirituality that causes us to eventually put on a facade mm-hmm. that our heart really isn't changed, that we don't become more loving in our day-to-day life, we just become more selective in our day-to-day <sighs> life. We don't become more truthful, we just avoid untruthful situations. And we don't become more humble. We don't look at ourselves very much. We look at everything else and what's wrong with the rest of society. In addition to that, it stops us from having a relationship with people or certain types of people. It causes barriers. Mm -hmm. It also stops us and prevents us from having a long-term growing relationship with God. And as a result of that, it causes us to go into stagnation. So when a person in, is involved in pseudo-spirituality, eventually they get to the point where it no longer feels that it satisfies them. Mm-hmm. So many in the audience yeah. may have noticed that with their investigation of spiritual matters, they've progressed to a certain point in a certain path and they've investigated it fully and sometimes got fully involved in the entire thing and, and investigated fully and then you got to a point where you can feel, no, there's a lot wrong now. There's a lot wrong with where I'm going on this path now. And, and then, you have to, then you finish up stopping and then deciding, oh, I've got to look for something else now. So you turn your head and you look for something else instead. And, and that's a sign that that original thing that you were looking at was a part of the pseudo-spiritual movement, if you like. And I feel, you know, we're saying that this pseudo-spiritual movement is so rife on the planet, aren't we? And I feel that's because often it is quite scary for us to really look inside our heart. (laughs) And so the facade, I know for myself, becomes very attractive. If I could just think my way through this whole thing and be a better person, I wouldn't have to face how I am now. Um, So I can see why that happens. But then as you're describing this, when we go down a path and we get basically to the end of it we think I can't relate to this anymore and we try another one and another one and eventually it gets tired there's so much grief involved because you put your whole heart into it I feel like then you get there's there's pseudo spirituality and then there's a lot of cynicism about spirituality isn't there yes because what happens when we we involve ourselves in the investigation of a pseudo spiritual path we get to you know we might have done it for 10 years or 15 years so many of us have done it for our whole lives to a certain point and so, you know, if you've been doing it for 10, 15, 20 years and then all of a sudden you, it, it dawns upon you that there's whole areas that are wrong with it, yeah. then there's a tendency to become very cynical about all forms of spirituality. And we see that occurring. Both you and I have seen that many times where people have come along to the sessions with so much cynicism because they've just spent their entire life looking at different areas of spirituality and then they've realised that there's, all some, there's always something wrong in the end. Yes. And so in the end they start going, well, well, there's no point to examine or to look. Yes, yeah. yeah. You'd like to ask? Can I just... Is this the same with the spirits in the spirit world? Their beliefs around reincarnation and, you know, being a Christian and what happens when you get to the spirit world... That's why they stop the search once they get there? Yes. No, that happens very much so. Many people would think on the earth that once you entered the spirit world, you'd have far more openness to search. But oftentimes what happens is exactly the opposite of that. Many people on earth have been, let's say they were a Christian and they've been involved in the Christian movement all of their life and they expect when they pass that they will be... um, that they'll be, you know, with Jesus in the heavens next to God and then all of a sudden they pass over and they're not with Jesus in the heavens next to God many Christians then become very disillusioned with their entire belief system. So, so they throw out everything. Like they, they think that none of it could have been true. And, and while there are bits and pieces of it true, they even throw out all those bits and pieces. 
and, and make the, none of it's true because they're so disillusioned with the fact that their belief system was not satisfied once they had passed. And that applies to almost all forms of religion um, it, it, who, who pass. There are many people who pass who have not yet embraced the true spiritual, this true spirituality, which we'll talk more about tomorrow. And so what they've done is they've lived their lives in a pseudo-spiritual state, expecting with, with expectations about what would happen when they pass. And then when they pass over, those expectations are not fulfilled, and so they feel very disillusioned, they feel very angry and upset with their religion oftentimes. And as a result of that, they then attempt to influence people on the planet on the opposite direction that they themselves were um, involved in when they were on Earth. And uh, you see many, many spirits, uh, and, talk, and I've talked to many, many thousands of spirits who have been into that, in that state. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So that's a good question. Yeah. So maybe we could just move on to describe some of the hallmarks of pseudo-spirituality, some of the things that we often see in the attributes, if you like, of pseudo-spiritual practice. Yeah, that'd so, be good, I think. Yeah. Um, perhaps I should write them on the board too, yeah. I think, as yeah. we go. So we'll do them one so, at a time and... So we're talking pseudo-spirituality. So what's the first one? The that first thing on the list is that it's often complex and requires a lot of intellectual reasoning. So this is the, um, one of the attributes of pseudo-spirituality. Has anyone been involved in a spiritual path that required a lot of head? Yeah, yeah. So um, tomorrow we'll present what the contrast is to this with true spirituality. But if you look at a lot of uh, pseudo-spirituality on the planet, it requires you to nut it out. Like, oh, there's that and there's that. Uh, for example, a lot of the metaphysical stuff that you see uh, presented. You've got to learn about the spirit body and you've got to learn about all of these so-called bodies that we have and, and, and learn about how you, know, you can think a certain way and change a relationship between that and the body. Now... For an average two or three year old child, that's pretty difficult. Yes. And, and my feelings are that true spirituality is very different in the sense because true spirituality will let the two or three year old child understand it. Absolutely. Whereas, um, but pseudo spirituality needs an adult, sometimes with a degree, to understand. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and so we have to uh, have a lot of intellectual reasoning, a lot of intellectual argumentation, a lot of philosophical. Uh, reasoning and and often it's in disharmony with logic as well so you know yeah. that's part of the problem so why does that appeal to so many people what are the what are the emotions that drive us to to think yes this must be spirituality one of the primary emotions is the emotion of uh, of wanting things to be clever so that then we can think we're clever, we're clever yeah <laughs> so so if we believe a clever thing then that makes us clever yes um, and that comes from an unhealed emotion in us that uh, that that you know where where intellect is lauded as as the as god basically and and inside of us we often feel that we're not clever enough when we look for belief systems like that and so we become addicted to clever belief systems that in the end um, we often find are not very logical and prevent our development, actually. Yeah, and I suppose um, one of the other features we talked about was that it often promotes hierarchy in relationships. So let's uh, write that one down. And I suppose that relates to that emotion as well, doesn't it? If we're used to feeling inadequate or not clever, we can... Hierarchy. R C H. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. If we're used to not feeling clever, and then we engage in something that makes us feel clever, but only the people who get it, then we're immediately setting up a hierarchy with other people, aren't we? Yes, and this is where we see um, a lot of the pseudo spiritual forms on the planet require a guru to teach a disciple. The disciple then becomes a guru over a period of time, and he teaches the next disciple, sort of thing. Yeah. And and so you find in a lot of Eastern forms of spirituality, in particular, where a person has a guru that they connect with, and it's looked down upon if they, you know, 
leave that guru to, to do their own investigation. Mm -hmm. And uh, these kind of forms of spirituality cr that create hierarchy of any kind. If you look in a Christian religious form, you've often got the priest and the laity. The priest could class and the laity, the people who the priests are meant to serve, but in, instead most of the time they finish up bossing them around. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You, you find and even above the priests, then we have bishops and Of course, you've got a hierarchy yeah. above that yeah. as well. And then uh, oftentimes uh, with other religious forms, the, uh, you know, the Muslim religion and so forth, you have a very similar levels of hierarchy in the religious form. So, so anything that promotes hierarchy it has to be questioned because in the end we are all equal. We have from, uh, we are, it, it would make sense if we, if we were created by a God that we must all be... God's children, mm -hmm. and so therefore we must all have an equal stance in God's eyes. And if that's the case, then we've got to question all forms of hierarchy, in fact. Now, there's a difference between hierarchy and authority. Yes. Because obviously a person, uh, you know, if we look at a normal society, there does need to be a degree of authority for a normal society to run in a manner that's loving in particular. And if love became the authority... Mm. If so, if love and truth was the actual authority that we all had to abide by, then uh, we would have no problems and we wouldn't need a hierarchy at all, in yes. fact. Um, so the, the issue with hierarchy is all about su pseudo-spirituality. Often you and I are, are uh, accused of having a cult, which is like uh, one of the fears of society about hierarchy. And the reality is that any, anybody who knows us and who spends time with us knows that we are not into hierarchy at all. We're not into controlling people's lives, telling them what to do. All we do is just have discussions like this where people can make up their own mind and take what they wish or want from it and leave the rest as, as they will. And they can also work on their own relationship with God. They don't need a mediator, so therefore they don't need somebody in a better position than themselves. That being said, it is very handy at times having to, to learn from somebody who is obviously more of something. So, for example, if we go along to a university of some kind, we would expect the person who's teaching us at university to know more about the subject than we do. Yes. Otherwise, uh, it's pointless going. Yes. And, and it's the same when it comes to subjects related to spirituality. There are obviously people uh, on the planet who would know more than other people do about that subject... And it is advisable to talk with them, but not to uh, worship them or lord them. So it's so. really we're talking here about the, the idea of status and someone having yes. more worth than another because yes. they are more developed in some way. Yes. That, so pseudo-spirituality often promotes that underlying f feeling. Promotes yeah. the feeling, and that's probably a good word, status, um, that we could add to there. Like promotes this idea that some people... We're all equal, but some people are more equal than others, <laughs> which is very, that very communistic uh, yeah. distortion that occurred to communism. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I feel that that is a major mark, again, of, of spirituality that is going to be stagnant to human development. Yeah, mm. beautiful. Okay, so some of the other things we listed that you've touched on, it's often illogical. So when we engage our logical mind, it doesn't make a lot of sense often. Yeah, so let's uh, write that down. Pseudo-spirituality is often illogical. Um, it doesn't have any... Um, what, what, did, what else did I put there? Uh, it doesn't... It doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't... It doesn't um, make intellectual sense. Yeah. 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 When we engage our rational mind, often, often with spiritual movements, we're asked to disengage our rational mind, aren't we, and just have faith or... Um, and really that's, that's not a mark of true spirituality, is it? Yes, and if you, if you see that in... You see that in all forms of religions that are very prevalent on the planet. So if, if again, we look at the so-called so Christian religion that's currently uh, portrayed on the planet, we can see that they have this belief system of the Holy Trinity, which is God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Ghost... Um, all three being co-equal, co-eternal and, uh, and also omniscient. And therefore they believe that Jesus um, is the same as God. And uh, quite often one of the main attacks that I get from the media is that I'm claiming that I'm God. Mm. And I've never claimed that at all and never will. 
I, I am not God, I am just a person just whose name is Jesus. <laughs> um, and that's it. Um, and the reason why they believe that is because um, often there's a, this, uh, in pseudo-spirituality, mysticism is generally loved. So, so in other words, it's great when you've just got to have faith and yeah. no logic and no intellectual sense. Yeah. Um, because then you can say, when somebody says to you, oh, I, don't, I, I can't see how that works, you can say, oh, I know, it's not understandable. Nothing of God is understandable. So you've just got to take it by faith. And it's a great way of avoiding lots of logical questions. So that's a very good. Um, how is it possible for pseudo-spirituality to require intellectual reasoning and have no intellectual sense? Isn't that a contradiction? No, it's not actually. <laughs> because what happens is that they require intellectual reasoning with regard to understanding certain things metaphysically in a complex nature, but often when you examine the complex nature of the metaphysics, it has no logical sense. So it requires a huge amount of intellect and philosophy to understand, but in the end, once you get down to the nuts and bolts of it, it, it is not logical. Uh, if I can give you an example of this. Uh, in metaphysics, uh, in a lot of so-called New Age spirituality today, there is this concept that if you fix the spirit body's uh, energy systems, then you automatically heal the physical body. That's the concept. And what they do to fix the spirit body's energy systems is they generally get a person on a table and they work on the spirit body of the individual with the aid of some spirits but also with the aid of energy healing or, and different apparatus on earth. And they get the spirit body into a state of what they call all of the chakras open. In other words, a state of one or oneness. They get work on the spirit body. Now, firstly, to understand all of that is quite complicated in terms of understanding you know, how that works and so forth. But in the end, it's not very logical because what happens is usually that person walks out the door and then within a week gets their spirit body back into the, exactly the same state that it was the week before they went to the person who was the therapist. So from a logical perspective, the, doing all of that work, while it did have a temporary effect on the body and the spirit body of the individual, it obviously hasn't permanently solved the problem. So there's got to be something else going on. And they say that oh, it just means that you didn't engage the process intellectually and so forth. But even that doesn't make sense logically why do you have to engage something intellectually when your body is full of emotions and feelings? Surely it would also need your emotions and feelings to be involved in what happens. So, so what I'm saying here is that here there's a lot of complex intellectual reasoning, but the reasoning is not logical. When we start applying logic to the intellectual reasoning, we can start seeing where it falls down. That's basically what we're saying. So, th so, so there isn't a, a, co a contradiction between these two points, but it's great that you that pointed that out because most people feel there is a contradiction between those two points. Yeah. Other examples that come to mind are um, texts that are very intellect-heavy, like A Course in Miracles or the Urantia book, that um, uh, reading them involves a lot of my intellectual... Uh, attention I think okay what does that mean right what does that mean what does that mean and I can read for half a day and then I sit down and I go but hang on uh, that doesn't make sense it, logically I don't understand how that helps me grow or mm. yeah, so yeah yep. that's another so you, you often see this bombardment if you like of complex intellectual reasoning but when you really analyse it simply with logic you often see that there are holes in it there, there are holes in the arguments and, and it's the holes that cause our soul to doubt. So whenever we see holes in things, we then go into doubt, which is understandable. We need to do that because, because obviously it's showing us that there's something wrong. And uh, we need, once we find the true spirituality, which I would call God's spirituality, the way God created us to be, there should be no holes. There should be no, everything should be answered. And it should be something that we can grow as we grow with. The answers become even more fascinating, but, but they build upon the previous answers. That, that would make sense if, it all, if, if everything was logical and everything was as simple to understand as the basic ground roots foundation. Then as we built on that foundation and gained more and more knowledge through a process, then that knowledge would just build on the foundation. We wouldn't have to throw out the foundation every time. Mm -hmm. 
and that's the difference between pseudo spirituality and true spirituality. Yeah. Okay. So uh, next on our list, we had mystical and mysterious. Yep. Flaky and irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> mystical. Yeah. So I suppose I can relate uh, some examples here for myself. Um, what was the other one? Flaky. Flaky and irrelevant. Irrelevant, that's right. Uh, obviously, I'm not the only woman on the planet claiming to be Mary Magdalene. Um, and at times I get contacted by other women who are making such claims. Um, and not to make a generalisation of all of them, but some of them certainly are very invested in the mystical um, earth mother womb thing that that seems very mystical, mysterious and seems to hold deep meaning. But when I investigate or engage a discussion, I find that a lot of what they're saying is just very pretty words that as not based in a, a real practice in life or in a relationship with God. And then and when you engage them, they often respond in rage, in anger which, is, and, yes. which is proof that they're not loving, which is also proof that they're not very developed yes. from a spiritual perspective. And my feeling is that beautiful words become very irrelevant and quite flaky if they're not based in anything that means anything in our yes. life. Yeah. So I feel there's a lot of forms of spirituality that, are, that have become so... Uh, focused on the mysterious, that everybody gets fascinated because of it's all mysterious and they all get fascinated and involved in everything. But after a while, the mysterious also starts to turn you off as well. It, it, it starts to frustrate you. It feels like there are no answers to any question that you ask. It feels so like, difficult to understand again. And as a result, we often go through with, with a lot of these forms of investigation. We investigate the mysterious and then because there's seemingly no real answer that, 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 that makes any logical sense or emotional sense, um, we then finish up going, well, I don't know. And, and it then causes us to go, well, I don't know about everything yeah. and to give up even investigating any further. And that, I feel that is a major problem because, because the reality is there, true spirituality gives us answers. Yeah. It gives us very, very clear answers about, and, and most of the time very simple answers about very uh, complex matters. And it, it also appeals to our soul so much because we are, in the end, uh, Raisin's theorem is the theorem that most of our souls are built by, which is this, this whole idea that if it's the most simple explanation then it's probably the truth yeah. yeah but i suppose and this probably leads to another point that many of us are addicted to mystery aren't we and we're addicted to the facade like it seems like our whole world is really loves bright shiny pretty things mm -hmm. um and so and it doesn't even matter if it's got any function Yes. <laughs> as long as it's pretty, it's, it's great. I'm thinking now of my earrings. But anyway. Because <laughs> um, uh, one of the points we've got here is that pseudo-spirituality often appeals to the error within us. Mm -hmm. So if, if we're not wanting to confront the realness inside of us, then pseudo-spirituality be can become... This, all this mysticism and everything can become a great way of avoiding things, can't it? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Very, so, very big way. Yeah. Our addictions and our injuries can be fed, yeah. yeah. And and that's the next point, which is fake promote and uh, fake and promotes and loves the facade. Yeah. Yes, I, I think that's uh, part of. Uh, so we're saying it's fake, and it promotes and loves facade. Now, the problem with our society generally is it's fake and promotes a lot of facade <laughs> because, uh, you know, a lot of the times where, you know, if you look at the general reasons why we do many things even in society, um, we do it because of how things look to yeah. other people even. We, we even know ourselves many times that, that it's not really how we're portraying it, but the reality is it looks good to others and so we continue to engage it because we then get their approval and yeah. their acceptance. And this is what uh, is the underlying emotion driving this with, with, uh, with pseudo-spirituality. Because, because there, are, there is no real true heart change, then, then they have to fake a loving condition mm -hmm. rather than actually be in a loving condition. So there's a big difference between those two states, faking a loving condition and being in a loving condition. If we're truly in a loving condition, when we get under pressure, our love does not change. Yeah. 
when we're not in a loving condition and we're just in a fake condition, when we're put under pressure, how we respond changes and it becomes less loving. And this is a good indication that, it, that it's only a fake spirituality. It's not yet hit our heart. Because when, when, tr- when spirituality hits our heart, it changes our heart in such a way that it's impossible for us to act in an unloving manner. And this is why I find it interesting with those many people who, uh, who email you about being Mary Magdalene, um, who are often at the same time abusive, swearing at you and, and quite violent in their emails. Yeah. And, and to me, that's a great indication. They're under pressure and look how they're acting now. Yeah. And there is a problem there, obviously. Yeah, I find it bizarre to think that I exert any pressure, but any, <laughs> anyway. Well, their, their pressure is, their internal pressure is their fear that they might not be saying is the truth. true, yeah. And, sure. and like there's been many times when you've been put under pressure, but you haven't acted in the same manner. Yeah. So where people have criticised you and said that you're definitely not Mary Magdalene, and that's fine, you've said, oh, that's okay, you're allowed to believe that, so it's fine. You know, yeah. it's a totally different response, which is an indication of more real development than pseudo-spiritual development. Oh, thanks, Pat. It's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A lot of people don't understand what, you know, what kind of emails and stuff we receive. And, and I feel a lot of times you know, those heavy attacking emails that we receive is, are an Im- immediate indication of the lack of development, real development in the heart of the people who are attacking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, another thing we've got here is embellished, frilly, polished and marketed. (laughs) (laughs) Embellished? (laughs) We're really getting a visual image here. Who can think of one? Sorry? No, we didn't. No, we didn't. We just come up with these (laughs) a a few. Well, actually, we come up with a lot of these when we were travelling to England and we would have loved to have given this talk to an audience in England. But the majority of the audience in England were overcloaked by spirits and none of the spirits would let us give the talk. Yeah, it was And so they kept intense. distracting us. And, uh, and so in the end we gave up the whole concept of being able to give the yeah. talk uh, until another time when we had an audience that was a bit more open to the, yeah. to the concepts. So, we've so got let's write them down. Embellished. Frilly. Frilly. Polished. Polished. And marketed. And marketed. Now, you and I are not opposed to things looking good, but no. um, we certainly don't have a smoke machine. And, <laughs> and when our videos uh, are edited, they're not all prettied up. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. The, the polished and marketed is interesting because that's been part of religious uh, life for many, many thousands of years. And we often see ministers dressed in this garb, which is not only expensive, but also uh, quite impractical at times and, uh, and they're head to toe with it, which is an indication that they are the minister. In other words, it separates them yeah. uh, and it gives them status. And we often see this in all forms of religion where there are these polished things. I once went along to a New Age seminar uh, of, a, of a person who's quite popular and well-renowned. It was here, here in Sydney, actually, that I went. And... Uh, she walked out onto the stage dressed in this white robe and she, she stood up and she walked out of the stage and she held her hands out like this and her robe was dressed like an angel and it made her look like, you know, an angel with wings. And I thought, yep, yeah, that's a person who's into that form of spirituality. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that, that form of spirituality, while it may initially feel attractive, um, it really is appealing to the eyes um, and, the, and it's also appealing to some underlying emotions within a person that things have to look good to actually be re- true. Do you um, think that's because inherently we know that God and spirituality should be beautiful, um, but we're just not willing to face how it is now? Do you think that's why it's so appealing to us? I think, yeah, I think that's part of it. I, I feel that it's more to do with our definition of what is beautiful. Yeah. Um, you see, we don't, on earth we don't necessarily see love as beautiful. Mm. We see love as weak. Um, and so when a person actually displays love, we don't necessarily notice them very much. In fact, many people on earth who display love are not noticed well at all. And many of the people who are not loving are well-renowned on, on the planet. And this is because we don't really respect love. We, th- we believe love is a weak quality to display. 
And I feel that a lot of it's to do with that. It, we embellish it so that it looks good, so that at least there's another f- attractor other than the love itself. Yeah. yeah. I think that's been my thing before I started having memories. I was on this spiritual quest as well, and I'd always get to a point where I'd think, I can't feel love in this situation. It's all mm. words and pretty and all of that, but where is the, the love that's growing? Because that was always a, the feeling for me, yeah. Yeah. And, and the reality is, and we'll talk more about this tomorrow again, but the reality is that true spirituality will always cause us to develop in love. Yeah. We'll always become more loving, more loving in our relationships, more loving in our day-to-day life, more loving towards the environment and, and, and many other areas which we will list tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the next one on the list is interesting. We've said it panders to fear and grief. What do we mean by that? What do you mean by that? Um, Pandas to fear and grief. When I say pandas to it, what I mean is it tries to prevent both emotions. It tries to um, it tries to make both of those emotions go away rather than actually being felt. So, so for, in other words, pandas to fear. So, much of society is in fear about all sorts of things. The media are great at pandering to society's fear. They've learnt that the way to sell papers is to get the worst possible story you can, beat it up as much as you possibly can, cause everybody to be terrified and then they'll have lots of sales. So, right? so there you're not saying it takes away people's fear. No. It resonates with the fear in It people. resonates their fear and actually, in a way, it actually generates more fear. Mm-hmm. This is the trouble with pandering to fear, is that pandering to fear actually usually causes an individual to grow in fear. So if you look at most of the religious formats that are on the planet today, most of them cause people who are a part of that religion to actually have more fear rather than less. Mm. So, for example, um, the, the Christian religious forms, for example, there's a huge fear of God in the Christian religion's forms. Then you look at the Muslim religion and there's a huge fear of God in the Muslim religion as well. So, so there are two big religions on the planet. There's one around or close to one half of the world's population is governed by these two religious forms. And yet they both have a huge fear of God and they pander to that fear. They tell their, they, they, they inculcate this fear into their, um, into their constituents, if you could call them constituents, <laughs> followers, their believers. Yeah. Um, but not only that, they, they don't just state the truth, but they prevent, present the truth in such a way as to modify behaviour, to push a person into a certain form of behaviour. And the alternative is, and this is the growing forms of religion now on the planet, are almost entirely the opposite of that, which I still feel is pandering to fear. And what they do is they try to avoid any subject that could cause anybody to feel afraid. Right? So, so they avoid talking about what's happening to the earth. They avoid talking... And in fact, there's a general philosophy in the USA, uh, for example, with it comes to environmental uh, discussion, that, that if you talk about the environment from the point of view of immediate impact then you're going to have not many people listen to you because they're mostly worried about their social and economic impact. And so, so anything that causes people to fear immediate impact, they won't actually listen to. So there are whole groups of religions as well on the planet or, or forms of spiritual development that try to avoid any confrontation of any fear. So, yeah, it's basically you're saying we're avoiding the confrontation of fear in both situations, aren't we? Yep. We're either saying, yes, be afraid, be afraid, be afraid, but never confront that fear or, or deny. Release it. Or release or rele- it. Or never release it. Yep. Or just deny, la, 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 nothing's yeah, la, happening. La, 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 yep. la, that's not yep. happening. <laughs> <laughs> Head in the sand, Austria style. Yep. Um, and that is, uh, is also another way that many, uh, many belief systems create this way so that we can avoid the truth. And... Truth, truth is sometimes going to be confronting. Sometimes truth will cause us to feel afraid, not because the truth is unloving, but because we have unloving the belief systems inside of us that need to be released. So, so truth will always confront error and will confront fear. It won't pander to it. it, won't, yeah. but, it but it also won't um, want the individual to stay in it either. Yeah. It, it, so it doesn't try to manipulate the person with their fear. 
The same applies to grief. Like uh, I see the same happening with many forms of religion. They are created, some belief systems are created to prevent grief, to prevent you from even experiencing grief. And, uh, and grief is a, is a primary uh, emotion that most people on the planet have that we need to release at some point because most of us have been treated badly at some point in our lives. And as a result, we need to release this grief. But, but a belief system that panders to our grief or supports our grief, either in a supportive sense, in the sense that it wants us to be in grief, or it wants us to completely avoid our grief, either one is going to be damaging and also, I feel, another, another way of defining pseudo-spirituality. Mm. It's not real. It's not going to change us if we stay in that state. Yeah, because I suppose what I see in a lot of new age sort of, if I can call it that, or Eastern philosophy is there's quite a lot of condescension between the expression of fear and grief, mm. uh, regarding the expression of fear and grief. Yes. Uh, and then in, say, things like Islam and Christianity, in many of those populations, there's a promotion of living in fear, or even of each other at times, yes. or of, of God, of different things, yes. and to to maintain a sense of loss but never actually grieve. Yes. Uh, or, yeah, or skip over grief in some pseudo kind of a way. Yes, yeah. and so you end up with this, in, in those people, often this very nostalgic viewpoint of their own religion. Yes. That's why many times they can't give it up for something that's more positive because they have this feeling of nostalgia which is connected to their own grief that they can't give up the religion without having to lose something. Yeah. That is, uh, and really, what they'll finish up losing is they'll have to grieve, yeah. and then they'd be comfortable with change. But but many are not comfortable with change as a result. Yeah. 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 And why is grief so unattractive in our society when it it does such good for us? Um, it's a very good question. <laughs> the the main reason why it's so unattractive, I believe is for most people it's a painful emotion. And uh, if, I've, I've often spoken with people who have just had a loved one die, for example, and uh, we have so many complex belief systems about death that most of us don't believe that a person who dies is still alive, and so we feel like we've lost them forever. And, and so this is an underlying emotion that exists in most people on the planet. Now, when we lose a loved one, we, we then start going through that emotion. But the rest of society has that emotion. And so what happens is when they see a person going through the emotion they themselves have that they don't want to feel themselves, they'll then project at the individual that, you know, one week of grief's enough now, you've cried enough now, and now you've got to get on with your life type of feeling coming from them, you see. And so I feel there's a lot of fear about feeling the emotions of grief. And many people believe that if they feel an emotion, they'll get caught up in it forever. And the reality is quite the opposite. But many people believe they'll be caught forever if they feel an emotion. And so what they do is they spend a lot of their life avoiding the emotion or attempting to avoid the emotion. As a result of that, society generally is attempting to avoid the emotion. So it's, very, it's, it's been even very interesting when we've interacted with the media, isn't it, mm -hmm. Mary? Like... Um, We've, we've had people of the media come and be present with their secret cameras and hidden cameras, <laughs> present in an audience where everybody can see. And it's interesting, as soon as I speak with a person in the audience and they connect with some grief, they immediately hone the camera on the person. They're immediate, and when they talk, you know, they say how bad it is that I've now caused the person to feel grief. And, and there's this whole society concept that actually if you help a person connect with their grief that you're somehow damaging them. And, mm. uh, and so there are a lot of very damaging belief systems about grief. And also I think of it from, for in my experience, and I think it's common for many people, is when we're young and we connect with our grief, because uh, the adults around us are already in such a state of denial of their grief or they, they're invested in us making them avoid their grief, when we express grief or we connect to the sadness in us, it becomes threatening for them and they immediately want to shut us down. And so we associate the experience of grief with punishment. Like, whoa, you know, how's everyone going to react to me grieving now? And so there's a fear on top of just grieving. Yeah. I just 
Let's notice the... Um, just, just hold the mic a bit further. It's okay it. to grieve for pets. <laughs> yes, yes. I've noticed that, yes. Uh, in fact, How many people <laughs> grieve for their pets more than they grieve for... <laughs> Maybe for it allows them to then um, grieve for, uh, for other things under the disguise of grieving for pets. Exactly. That's yeah. exactly what is happening. Yeah. What happens is when we are attached to anything, that there is more of a society allowance of us doing something about... It will have a lot of other emotions about other things, but but they'll be imposed upon the process that we're in. Yeah. So so what happens for many people is that there's a small trigger in their life of something, but because it connects to so many other things in their life, they then connect to all of this heavy grief, and they wonder why am I crying so much? I've got no, you know like well, it was just a, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So but also I think mouse, people, people experience a sense of unconditional love from their pets that they often don't from others. And so they're actually grieving the lack of love in their entire life when they lose this pet. Often that's Yeah, because yeah. that pet's helping them avoid that. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. Well, they've filled up the board so far and there's All still right. another 20 or so to yeah. go, I think. Isn't yeah, it? there's so lots to go. That, um, one of the things I'd like to point out with this discussion is... If you add all of these things together, you can sort of see what defines pseudo-spirituality. And then what you can do is go, OK, any time I see these particular things present in some form of spirituality, then I, you know, when I'm investigating it, I've got to be careful with it because obviously it's, it's potentially got some problems with it. When we go through the list tomorrow and see the contrast between pseudo-spirituality and true spirituality, you'll see greatly the difference between the two. And when we do that, um, we'll create a similar list. And why we've done this is because what we're hopeful to do from this discussion is help a person not feel so confronted with how do they know what's right and how do they know what's wrong, how do they know what's worth investigating and how do they know what's not worth investigating. It's quite easy to, ter to determine, I feel, once you start looking at the qualities of you know, fake stuff compared to true stuff. And if you can compare the two, you'll see that there's a logical comparison that can be made and therefore uh, like you can utilise your time and effort investigating the things that are going to benefit you in the long run rather than not. Because really what we're saying, aren't we, is that everything that we're listing here, inherent in it means that there's going to be limitation on how much our heart can change. Yeah. So that's the yeah. Like if I'm not allowed to cry, yeah. at some point I'm going to have to cry. <laughs> So if I'm not allowed to cry, then that's going to stagnate my development at some point. I'll turn around and say these things to the audience after I've, yeah. <laughs> I've this that's off. So, for example, if, if I'm not allowed to be emotional when I'm investigating spiritual matters, now, assuming that emotions, if you look, you look at it from the point of view of emotions, come a lot from your heart, right? So if, if I'm not allowed to be emotional with regard to some form of spirituality, then that's going to prevent a whole side of my nature from ever being displayed while I'm in that form of spirituality. I, I'm not allowed to cry, I'm not allowed to laugh, I'm not allowed to you know, do, do all of these beautiful things that involve my feelings. And then again, if I've got a form of spirituality that has no intellectual development at all and it has no logical you know, sense to it and it's very, very complex and hard to understand, but, but it needs to be logical, if, it, if it's not logical, then I'll go, well, you know, what's the point in believing something that makes no logical sense at all? And so we can start adding together these different characteristics and come up with a, what, what do we look for if we're looking at spiritual things? What, what kind of hallmarks are there to the truth in comparison to error? Hmm. So maybe just following on from what you've said, we could discuss two things yeah. that are common. Uh, not co concurrently, but one is that often pseudo spirituality lords the intellect and condemns feelings. But yeah, yeah. So th some forms uh, follow that route. Lords intellect. Condemns emotion. But then conversely, there are some forms that are emotionally histrionic um, right. and enjoy fake expression. Right. So obviously these things aren't going to exist concurrently. Is that as histrionic? Yep, I see. Histrionic. 
Um, I was just wondering whether everyone sees that they might also seem uh, like contradictory. contradictory. But one form of uh, so pseudo spirituality often uh, laws the inter- you often see forms of spirituality that law the intellect. What I mean is that basically worship intellect without without examining emotion um, at all. So in other words, they they a whole part of our being as a human being we are emotional. A whole part of our being is shut down by that form of spirituality because we're promoting just the intellect only. True spirituality is going to promote both intellect and emotion, not be one or the other. Mm-hmm. So the second one here is the, the one or the other, where a person is allowed to be emotionally expressive as much as they like without any control, control or sense of... Uh, or sense of understanding about what's causing their emotions, and there's no logic in any of their emotions either, that is also an indication of pseudo-spirituality. Has anyone ever been involved in a form of spirituality where emotions are promoted, but it's quite histrionic? Yeah, yeah. yeah a few people. Yeah, yeah. a few people. <laughs> <laughs> Most, a lot of people run a mile from those forms yeah. of spirituality. <laughs> yeah. But a lot are very attracted to the, the top. Form where where it's very intellectual, and I've I've spoken to many ministers as you can imagine, and uh, and many of them I find almost completely detuned from their feelings on, on many discussions that I've had with them, where where they have avoided any discussion about feeling at all, and they are just philosophical, and they're even phys- philosophical about their own belief systems. They, they don't even know whether their own belief systems are true or not because they cannot feel whether they're true or not. So they, they can't determine the truth very easily with just your intellect. The reality is you need your intellect and your emotions together to actually be able to determine truth or true spirituality. Okay. So another thing we've listed here is that it's shallow and that no one has to change. Yes. Shallow, no one no one has to change and therefore, of course, no one does change. <laughs> and I, I've had said to me many times, it's okay, darling, we're all perfect. And, and I've often thought, and that's quite a, like been a spiritual thing to say and I've gone nope I'm pretty sure I'm not perfect right now (laughs) Um, that's an illusion darling and and (laughs) it feels like pretty much true to me yeah (laughs) but I can see that that actually negates me having to look at anything and change and it also negates you having to see whether you have any faults yeah whether you have any character flaws or faults that are unloving that you need to somehow correct it, it helps you avoid the truth of, uh, that, that we do need correction. If we've been brought up in environments that are unloving, we're going to have unloving feelings within us that we do need to correct and grow from. And if you have this viewpoint, oh, we're all perfect already, which is a very new age type of concept, um, the reality is that you look around, if we were all perfect already, the world we live in would all be perfect already. And logically, this is a logical statement, if we were all perfect already and we were all loving already, then the world we live in would be perfect already and the world we live in would be loving already. We wouldn't even be sitting here having this chat, in mm. fact, because we'd all be out enjoying our loving life <laughs> in our loving world <laughs> uh, without even looking at anything more because we already know, would know what the truth is. And the, I feel those kind of forms of spirituality are highly delusional, in fact. They, they are so delusional... They, they, many times I'm called delusional, but when I, look at, <laughs> when I look at how these forms of spirituality, I go, wow, they're highly delusional forms of spirituality. This belief that you're already perfect before you're perfect. But, is, and, is you know, delusion. I feel it's, it's the emotional kickback against people feeling so judged by things like Christian religion. I agree. And they don't want to feel the pain of that judgment. So then there's a complete flip over, which is there can be no judgment, we are all perfect, which is not logical. No. No. And there's a difference, and this is, what I feel, a misunderstanding of judgment. Yes. Judgment is an emotion directed at another individual where we are condemning them. Yeah. So it's a feeling that we're projecting at a person. It's not a, it's not a statement of truth. We can state the truth 
and not be judgmental at all. Yeah. So I can state the truth. I am not perfect. Yeah. Right? And uh, I can state that truth without judging the fact that I'm not perfect, uh, without condemning myself for not being perfect and so forth. And I can also make the stub- statement that you're not perfect either yes. <laughs> as a statement of truth without judging the fact that you're not perfect or condemning you for not being perfect. And, and this is where we need to have a focus on truth rather than judgment. But we also need to have a focus on understanding this, this point that, that true spirituality is going to change us. It is going to cause us, our life, to be different because... Our life does need to change. You look at the world we live in, and it is a mess. There are, there are, when we say a mess, let's look at what's actually happening. There are millions of children that die every year from starvation on a planet that's got plenty of food. Now, that's not a very loving nor logical thing. So that there's, a, there's something wrong there. there yeah. There's something causing that. There are, there are whole nations of people who are gathered in what, refugee camps that no other nation will let them into, yeah. like into their nation. So many nations on the world have total prosperity like we do here and yet we do not let all of the million people in a, in a refugee camp on the border of, you know, let's say on the border of, what is it, the African... Sudan. Su- the Sudanese border mm. to actually come here. Why yeah. don't we do that? Because we're so afraid that somehow they're going to influence our life in such a way that it's going... or it's going to reduce our quality of life in such a way. We, we've got so much food here that some years we burn it mm. or we destroy it and yet, and yet these other places in the planet are, are starving to death. Now, it's not logical... For us to say, well, obviously the forms of spirituality we're practicing haven't influenced our life enough to actually cause us to change on that particular thing. Yeah, and this is the the fear, isn't it? The the fear inherent that we're afraid to look at that. Mm. We're afraid to take responsibility. We're afraid to have to change, and so pseudo spirituality becomes. It becomes the norm and attractive, yeah. while real spirituality, the thing that's going to cause us to change and say, why, why don't we as a nation, for example, we're, we're well, made of, what, 15, 16 million uh, people now, why don't we let another million people come in? It's not going to make much difference to how much space is available in Australia somewhere. And we, we, we help them through the process. You imagine they're made of jobs that would be created through this process, helping these people come in and, and, and acclimatise to a new country, a new way of life, and, and we grow food for, for those people who we've invited into the country. We expect them to embrace our, our law systems, and if they don't, then we do something about that in terms of correcting that. And there's a whole series of things that would be created if we, as a society, embrace that. Um, but we don't because we're afraid and we don't want to change. That's right. And many times in the past I've had discussions with people who I would classify as being involved in pseudo-spirituality because in my life I've been quite connected to this, these things of injustice and people in poverty around the planet. And mm. I've discussed with them my travels to different places and they've said things to me like, well, it's all just a mirror. It's all an illusion. It's all, the, you know, those people can find God as much as we can find God. Mm. And well, you try finding God when you're starving to death and it's pretty, it's pretty hard when the, when, when the majority of your life is just focused on getting enough survival. water for the day and enough food for the day to actually contemplate anything else. And yes, and what struck me was the callousness, mm. the, the no heart connection mm. to other human beings. Yeah. And, and this is where I got the, how, where's the love? Where's, this is supposed to be spiritual and I can't feel yeah. the, you know, this is where it became flaky for me, that adjective we used before. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and also if you look at your life late, you, you lived in a refugee camp um, trying to help the effects of a problem yeah. and, this, and the effects were caused by most of the Western world living in pseudo-spiritual land yes. in the sense that you know, they all want to believe that they're loving but where they all have the resources to, to have every single one of those refugees put somewhere and yet we don't. Yeah. We just let them live there. Thousands and thousands. How, how many people in one square acre? Of, of uh, the camp so. I lived in had 20,000 people in one square kilometre. One yeah. square kilometre. Yeah. 
you know, and you, then you look at camps like the, in the even bigger. border. That was a small people, camp that I lived in. Yeah, in a few acres yeah. of land. It's yeah. just it's just crazy what we do, yeah. and yet we in the Western world often many of the developed Western world society believe that they are more loving, more developed, more this, more that, and yet if, if we were really more developed, we could not in our heart allow these things to continue. Yeah. So, so that's an indication that we're perhaps not as developed as we believe we are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it, it helps us avoid responsibility. Yes. And one of the points we've got here is that um, pseudo-spirituality is often self-righteous, yep. um, self-glorifying. So it inflates the soul in denial and promotes self-interest. Self-glorifying. Yeah, we've got self-righteous, self-glorifying and self-reliant, actually. Yeah, so self-righteous in the sense that we believe that we're better than we really are. So, so you know, if you, if you look at the actions of Western society towards other societies, our general action is to go and rape them, like not literally rape them, but we rape of their resources. land, we yeah. rape them of resources, we then condemn them for their response to that, and then we say, when, then we take the high and mighty position of, oh, we're developed and you're not. Mm. <laughs> like it's, it's hypocritical and also um, you know, very, very damaging to the rest of society. This is why we have many uh, countries in the world who feel quite antagonistic towards Western society and many other countries in the world trying to be like Western society yeah. because, because we're constantly taking. We're mm. constant. Now, if we were in a state of love, true development spiritually, we've got to ask ourselves, would we do that? Yeah. And of course we wouldn't. Uh, we wouldn't you know, destroy the resources of a, of, a, of a country and of the people who need those resources, particularly when they have less than us already. Mm. Like, it doesn't make any sense at all to do logically. It doesn't make any sense from an emotional perspective, from a perspective of love either. Mm. And so therefore, whatever spiritual form we're involved in is not motivating enough, uh, uh, enough of us to cause us to want to love somebody more. Yeah. And even love people that we don't know. Yeah. 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 Okay. So what are the other things? We've got here an emphasis on the metaphysical and no soul condition improvement. Yeah. So let's uh, write that down. So metaphysical emphasis or physical emphasis. And, and what we mean by that is that it focuses on either the physical body or the spirit body. Um, it does not focus on the soul. So when we say the soul, we're talking about the true self that can change, that changes in its attitudes and its feelings. Pseudo-spirituality doesn't focus very much on the true self that can change. It focuses on understanding all of the nuts and bolts of our body and all the nuts and bolts of our spirit body, how it all works. And, uh, and those forms of spirituality while they can have some kind of positive effect on our body and our spirit body, it's not going to change our soul. And it's our soul that needs to change if the world's going to change. Yeah. If the world's going to become more loving, we have to become more loving. Uh, and so we could almost say that a focus on metaphysics is like a distraction from the real issue. The real issues that we have on the planet are love. That's the real issue. There is a lack of love on the planet and the lack of love on the planet, you see it in relationships. You also see it in relationships between nations. That is the real issue we have. And the, we have that issue because we're not focused on developing true spirituality. We're not spoke, focused on love first, truth first, you know, yeah. being humble to our own condition when we're not loving or truthful first. And if we can focus on those things first, then we'll be able to change enough so that we become more loving. And when we become more loving, a lot of our problems on the planet will just disappear. And also, because that's right, we're ignoring that love actually governs the metaphysical and the physical. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We've got it in reverse order. Yeah, yeah, we think somehow if we change the physical or metaphysical that we'll become more loving. It's the opposite way around. If we change the love, we'll actually, our body, physically and metaphysically, will be assisted yeah. through the process. Yeah. yeah. Okay, another thing we had was uh, uh, pseudo-spirituality is often exclusive and creates groups and cliques. 
So exclusive groups and clicks and clicks. Yes. Yes. Um, exclusive. I didn't write that too good. <laughs> well, I started. Exclusive. exclusive groups and clicks, yeah. Um, yeah, we see this happening all the time where, um, and in fact, we often get accused of it as well, by the, again, by the media. Um, and I find it quite interesting how we get accused of something that they themselves are doing. Um, mm. And you often see this in, in, in day-to-day interaction where a person gets accused of something the other person who's accusing them actually does themselves. Mm. But with regard to exclusivity, um, obviously if a spiritual movement creates an exclusive group, then that group is not developed enough in love to accept that the rest of society who don't have their beliefs are just as acceptable as they themselves should be. So in other words, there's no sense of equality inside of the group. So so true spirituality will create equality. Mm -hmm. True spirituality will will start seeing everyone, even people who do not have the same beliefs as us, as as important to us as people who have the same beliefs. And, uh, And so we won't finish up trying to separate ourselves from the people who do not believe the same things we do. Mm. We, we will, in fact, embrace all of society more, mm. not less, mm. if we had true spirituality. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, another thing we've written here is um, that it often promotes indecision. Uh, Can yes, you talk about yes. that a little yeah. bit? Well, let's uh, better rub these out now. We're adding some more. We've actually written, weak, light and airy promotes indecision. So what was that one? Weak, light and airy. Promotes indecision. That's a HT and airy. I feel this uh, aspect of, uh, of pseudo-spirituality comes from an emotional feeling many of us have that we don't want to make decisions. <laughs> we, we like other people making decisions for yeah. us a lot of the yeah. times. And the reason why we do is we're afraid to make our own decisions because usually when we were children and we made our own decisions, we got punished for them at some point. Yes. Right? And so what we learnt to do as we grew up is that it's better to delay decisions as long as possible. We become procrastinators when it comes to decisions. And so we then feel attracted to um, spiritual movements that allow us to have an indecisive viewpoint about everything. Um, In other words, there is no truth, there is just your truth, is a lovely concept but it promotes indecision. Yeah. It, it actually says, right, all of us are allowed to have a different idea about truth. Right? Now, the reality is we're all allowed to, but that doesn't change the fact that there is God's truth mm-hmm. and God would know the whole truth about mm-hmm. something and we have the ability to discover that whole truth if we wish. And what it does is it promotes us, uh, it promotes this sort of more or less, oh, I don't really care so much attitude or scenario inside of us. So we start, we start going down the track of going, okay, yeah, they're allowed to do that and I'm allowed to do this and everything will be fine in the end. And, and I find that appeals to Australian society in particular <laughs> uh, because we, we in Australian society have, do have that attitude, that sort of laissez-faire type as attitude of, uh, you know, what, what happens happens and... and We'll all, we'll all be right in the long run. Sort of. yeah. she'll, be, she'll be right, <laughs> she'll be right <laughs> in the wrong right. run. Yeah. And, and while it's a lovely way to live society in the sense of it's very accepting, um, we, also, we also need to be careful with it because... Well, we can lose the compass of love, can't we? We can lose love in it, yeah. yeah. If, we, if we embrace love in it, that attitude is very loving. Yeah. Um, but if we lose the love in it, then uh, it, all it does is we finish up sitting down on our backside for the rest of our life, not really coming to any firm decision about anything. And once we do that, we also stop acting. Mm-hmm. We also stop taking action. 
we, because we're, we're allowed to. That's yeah. what indecision allows us to do. It's, yeah. It causes us to, to be able to avoid acting, and in particular acting in harmony with love. So, so when I see situations where it's quite obvious that everything is unloving, and I go, well, why is everyone acting like it's okay? Like yeah. that's because of indecision most of the time, and indecision oftentimes is driven by this underlying fear, fear yeah. that other people will attack us or other people will point out to us that we've done something wrong, which comes from our childhood of our parents doing the same thing every time we chose to do something that they didn't like. And what occurs to me as you're talking about all of these things is that they're really things that relate to our own character and nature, aren't they? So Mm -hmm. we can actually engage a spiritual quest um, from the standpoint of pseudo-spirituality or true spirituality, can't we? Mm -hmm. We can, Mm -hmm. if we we hold on to things like fear and we don't want to confront them, even if we find something that might speak truth, if we engage it in this pseudo-spiritual way, We can't actually grow. No. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose I see that, I mean, I believe what we're teaching is true spirituality, but I I do see some people who engage in it in a way where they don't confront their fear, even though that's what we promote, that that they still use different terminology to feed their the true terminology to feed the addictive state. And yeah, the reality is that a person could be presented with true spirituality but still within themselves decide to embrace it in a pseudo-spiritual manner. Yeah, Because it, pseudo-spirituality comes from our personal desires rather, from, rather than from the actual teaching itself. It's the qualities within ourself which govern our spiritual path, really, in the end, isn't it? It's exactly. It's not actually the path. It's a... It's it's the qualities we choose to foster in ourselves. Yes. Yeah. So, so true spirituality will actually embrace the qualities inside of ourselves rather than just talking about it without yeah. any true embracing of it. And so we need to understand that. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, can it work the opposite way around because there's lots of spiritual movements and religions? Um, People can be practicing true spirituality um, in those movements. I feel so. Definitely the case. That is definitely the case. So bear in mind in this discussion, when we talk about certain religious forms and generally what they do, we are not talking about the individuals in those religious groups because there are many individuals in those religious groups who are embracing spirituality in a true manner. You look at, you can see it changes their heart. You can see that it's changing their life. And even though some of the teachings may be out of harmony with logic or whatever, they personally themselves are changing. So this is where I've seen many people be taught the truth and still embrace it in a pseudo-spiritual manner. And I've seen many people taught error and embrace it in a truthful manner. Embrace true spirituality. Embrace it tr- yeah. in a true, spir- truly spiritual manner. In other words, they have their heart changed as a result into a more positive person as a result of that embracing of that truth. So in this discussion, we are not condemning all these religious forms or movements. What we're saying is, from an individual perspective, if we are involved in pseudo-spirituality, it, it is individually applies that we're involved in many of these things. Tomorrow, when we discuss true spirituality, you will see that for many people in the same religions are embracing true spirituality because they are embracing their heart, their lives are changing, they're becoming more loving, they're becoming more sincere, their relationships are improving and so forth. And so you can see that there is a true change inside of themselves. So please remember in this discussion of pseudo-spirituality versus true spirituality that we're talking about what happens inside of the individual, not inside of society or groups collectively. Because what happens collectively is often very, very different to what happens to the individual. Do, do everyone can see that? And so, so we, we can see that, that collectively in some groups there are hallmarks of pseudo-spiritual practice. Yes. Um, but that's We not know many people yes. who we're teaching these things to who are involved totally in pseudo-spirituality still. Definitely. Because their heart's not changing. They're, they're, they're still talking the talk and not walking the walk. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're not embracing love. They're not becoming more loving. In fact, some of them have become more unloving since we've known <laughs> yeah. them. And, and that is because of some of their emotions being challenged that they're now not allowing themselves to address in an appropriate manner and, and so forth. And I would say certainly in my life I've had friendships with many Muslim women, Christian women or um, 
women involved in new age kind of practice who I felt reflected true spirituality. They, they had an emphasis on love and um, growing in that love. Yeah. 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 So uh, it's a very good point, yeah. David. Yeah. And, and I feel sometimes in a discussion like this we've got to be careful because there are generalisations we can make about certain belief systems in religious movements which create, are created via, by, by pseudo-spiritual um, emotional reasons. But, uh, but that doesn't mean that every single person involved in that particular belief system is a pseudo-spiritual person. Mm. Because many, there are many people who are involved in all forms of religious expression and non-religious expression. I, even scientists, I, I feel some, many of them are quite... Uh, spiritual, like in the sense of embracing things with passion and desire, looking for truth, looking for understanding. Being humble to their mistakes. Being humble yeah. to their mistakes. In fact, many scientists are more humble to their own mistakes than many people in religions are. And so for that reason, they might, they might in fact be what we call an atheist, but the reality is that you know, in a lot of ways, in their heart, they are more spiritual. There are, there are many people on this planet who are much more loving because they're not in a religion rather than because they are. Because they, they have worked out logically. It makes no sense to not be loving um, to them. So, and they've embraced love in a positive manner. So I feel they are more spiritual <laughs> than, than people who are often involved in so-called spiritual investigation. Mm. Yeah. Great. Okay. So some other hallmarks that we've got here that you've pretty much covered appeals to error, injury and addiction. So yeah. that's the different so appeals to emotions it. we've been talking about. So that's engaging in a practice which helps me live in addiction or um, rather than confront it. Would you say that? Yeah, so if we examine that uh, more carefully, you can see that... Uh, Many times religion, religious viewpoints are established and I'm now talking about the viewpoint of the religion, not necessarily of the persons the in the religion. Yep. But religious viewpoints are often established because of a collective emotional condition in the adherence to that particular religion. For, for example, there are many religions on this planet that believe that God is a powerful God of wrath who is going to at some point destroy the wicked. But many of you have probably been brought up in such religions when you were little. And now, now, this is a, a belief system that appeals to error in, the fact, in this way. Many of us have been hurt when we were, throughout our lives and we want the people who hurt us to be punished. Does that not make sense? Mm -hmm. So we desire them to be punished because they hurt us. As a result of that, we also do not wish to have to punish them ourselves. Often we're afraid of them or we feel we can't punish them ourselves. Or it wouldn't be loving. Or it wouldn't be loving <laughs> to punish them. And so what we do is we say, all right, let's make God do that for us. So we create a whole religious belief that God is going to come and punish any person that's wicked and Inside of us, it's any person who's treated me badly is wicked <laughs> and uh, the persons that are going to get punished by God. And uh, this religious belief then becomes established as a doctrine mm. that is then taught by that particular religion. And there are, like I pointed out, there are nearly three billion people on this planet who actually believe in that doctrine, that there is a punishing God who will come and punish the wicked. Mm. Now, that uh, belief, while it supports the emotional error, um, is not a truthful belief. Mm. You know, obviously, God is far, if, from a logical perspective, God is far more loving than the best person who's loving on earth. And if that's the case, then the best person who's loving on earth doesn't want to kill the wicked. Yeah. Uh, he wants the wicked to change. Yeah. He wants the wicked to become more righteous, right, if we could use that term. So surely God would desire that to a greater extent than the best person on earth who's loving would desire it. And so from a logical perspective, it's impossible that God could be a punishing God that's going to destroy the wicked. But because of this error that exists in us, that we want people to be punished for what they've done to us, uh, that we believe is in error, we then want to believe that God is a punishing God. And because we want to believe it, when somebody comes along and presents that viewpoint to us, we mm. accept it. Mm. 
mm. because we want to believe it. Yeah. And this is an example of uh, belief systems that appeal to error. Yeah. Instead, of, instead of appealing to love and truth, they appeal to error. Yeah. 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 Okay, another one we've got here is arrogant, denies true self and true condition. So uh, I think I've given in quite a few examples yeah. of that really at this point. Like, yeah. But if, if we look at the arrogance uh, that many of us have, even in Western society towards other societies, we can see that that's an arrogant position. We, we come along and, and we destroy other societies through our actions and then we say to them, why, have you, why haven't you got your act together mm-hmm. after we've just come along and destroyed you? Like, like that, that's a very arrogant position, very hypocritical position, demonstrates that as a society we don't have much spirituality, true spirituality. If we look at it from an individual perspective, it's like coming up to somebody, slapping them across the face and then saying, why are you angry? (laughs) Because, uh, you know, if we were really understanding of the situation, we'd never slap them in the first place, right? And uh, and this is what I feel we do with society. But we also do it in religious, in, in forms of spiritual development as well. We... We don't like to see ourselves as we truly are. That's the problem. We need to start seeing ourselves as we truly are. And that means warts and all, as the Mm. saying goes here in Australia. So we need to see every flaw before we can change any flaw. Yeah. And so you're not going to change anything you can't see. And we need to be able to see our true condition if we wish to change it. Now, any form of spiritual development that lets us see our real condition better than we did yesterday Mm. is very positive to our development. Any form of spiritual development that causes us to remain blind to our true condition or even become more blind than we were yesterday, that is very, very damaging to our spiritual development. And often uh, in different forms of spirituality, we have interactions with spirits, don't we? And that can give us the the illusion that we're more developed. Mm. Like I'm thinking now of people who are involved in healing. Often um, there are loving spirits who come and assist with that healing, but the danger is that the person then perceives that's their own condition. Yeah, I'm so loving I can heal you. Yes. When when in reality they've got all these spirits around them healing the person despite their unloving condition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And that's another one of the points that we have here is that... um, that we often feel good through spirit attachment. Yeah. So there's a, a codependent relationship can develop with spirits in pseudo-spirituality. Yeah, and, and I think we need to talk about that as a major heading, actually. Yeah, how, as we go how, on, When we yeah. get to that. Yeah. There's, a, there's, there's two probably major headings we need to talk about. One, one is the major point about how spirits are involved in pseudo-spirituality and how we involve them in that process. And the second main point we want to raise at some point uh, in this discussion today is, a, is how um, sexuality is also often involved either in a suppressed manner or in an overt manner in pseudo-spirituality. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we need to discuss both of those points yeah. too because they are major hallmarks of something that doesn't change us but rather keeps us in a certain state. Yeah. Mm. Okay, well, we're nearly through this list. Mm-hmm. There's one here that is quite interesting. Uh, we've written appeals to the hearts of few, but many follow. What do you mean by this? <laughs> yeah, so let's write that down, actually. Appeals to hearts of few, but many follow. Yeah, I'll just uh, rub out the rest of these while I'm up. Well, as we've pointed out, pseudo-spirituality often appeals to addictions, to false beliefs, to intellectual reasoning, often that is flawed. Um, It often appeals to um, emotions within us that are out of harmony with love. Mm -hmm. 
And for that reason, it can't appeal to the heart. It's got to appeal to something else. So the heart representing our desire. The heart representing our true self, our true being, our true soul based passions and desires. So often what you find is a person has to force themselves to go along to that particular spiritual path. You know, say many Christians, for example, and this is an illustration of what's happened in Australia, many Christians over the last century have become so tired of getting up Sunday morning and having to go to church. And so what do we find now in Australia? There's probably less than 5% of the population who are involved in any form of church-going activity because... They've just become, it hasn't appealed to their heart to go. <laughs> I was just thinking, and there's a lot of evening services as well because <laughs> of the morning part. Yeah, the morning part as well. But, but even that has all, you know, the churches, uh, as we know, many of them, the main, particularly mainstream, ha- have died off. Very, yeah. And m- many of our churches are now halls or, yeah. <laughs> or, or other, other, other things, some are houses even. And the reason why is because it hasn't really appealed to the heart. You just felt like you had to go. Yeah. So, so why did we go? We go because we are so uh, worried about perception, you know, about what other people, our family, our friends or whatever will think of us. That's why we go. But it's not really in our heart. It's not, it, we go because of, the, of society pressure. Generally. Yeah, and that makes me reminds me of a story that we heard recently. We had a couple stay with us from Montreal, mm-hmm. and I'm not sure of the full history of this, so don't quote me, but they were telling us about um, they'd be in their late 40s, 50s, and they were saying when they were kids in Montreal, the church was massive, and the whole everyone went to church every Sunday, every Sunday. And then there, there came... So there was huge societal pressure that they should all go. Mm-hmm. There came a point where there was a meeting about religion, amongst all of these church groups in Montreal, they all got together and they all got straight with each other and went, yeah, we don't really believe it, yeah, we don't really like it. And nobody went. All of these churches in Montreal, that's I'm telling so, the yeah, story correctly, aren't I? over a very I? short period of time... It, religion died religion in Montreal. Died. Yeah. Like, just in a, in a very short period of time as a result. Yeah, yeah. so it obviously wasn't in their hearts. It was, it was society It was based. just society pressure. And, and this is where many follow because... Oftentimes, uh, many follow a certain theme because of society pressure. Yeah. And as soon as you give up the society pressure, nobody bothers <laughs> anymore. And here in Australia, I love Australia because we've given up so much society pressure. There's it's not all gone, society pressure, and yeah. particularly when it comes to religion. Yeah. And so that means that everyone is free to do whatever they want on a Sunday, which is fantastic. <laughs> and, Go uh, surfing. And, yeah, <laughs> and some people are more religious going surfing than they are uh, going to their religion. And often they sit there, you know, out on the board looking at the sun and the sea and having a feeling in their heart of appreciation for, for where they are. Which could be truly which, which spiritual. Which is truly spiritual yeah. <laughs> in comparison to sitting in a uh, hall yeah. where they resent everybody being present and their own presence, yeah. uh, which is not very spiritual at all. Yeah, yeah. 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 Joy? Uh, I think you've answered the question. Is that why it's so big in America? Just uh, if we can sort out the mic issue, it's probably... Should be on? Is it, is it on at the bottom? Is it really white? Yeah, that's on. That's on. Hello. Can't hear you at all. <coughs> Can we just have the other one? Thank you. Must be batteries or something. Um, is that why it's so big in America? Is it just societal pressure? Um, there's a number of things that go on in each... Uh, uh, we can, rather than talking about one country in particular... Um, Let's talk about countries generally. Um, In every single country, there is generally quite a large number of what I would call society-based emotions, which are society belief systems caused by what happened multi-generationally over a long period of time. These, These conditions often determine what happens in a particular country with regard to spiritual beliefs. So this is why some countries are dominantly Christian, and some countries are dominantly you know, other forms of religion. However, if you look at some of the countries that are dominantly one form of religion, you can see that many times the religion hasn't, hasn't hit their heart. So, for example, in America, they're perfectly capable of preemptive strikes against other countries, for example. Now that's a, and, and the president who evoked those strikes was a Christian minister, a, Christian, a member of a Christian faith. So that, that indicates how the, the religion has not yet changed them spiritually, hasn't changed them in their heart. 
and this is the problem for many countries, is that, is that we have this sort of pseudo-spirituality where we sort of separate spirituality from having any heart-based effect on our day-to-day -day life. True spirituality is going to have an effect on every single aspect of our life, every single interaction we have with every single person, every single interaction we have with every single creature is going to be changed by our embracing true spirituality. Um, the problem is, for the majority, is that we don't want to go to that extent of change in our life. Mm. And so what we do is we love pseudo-spirituality as a result because it causes us to still remain the same while still feeling like we're doing something different. Mm. <laughs> um, so, so, for example, the average Christian person in America has very little different in emotion is very very little difference in emotions between the average christian person in america and the average muslim person in iraq there are very few emotional differences at the core level in terms of what they will what they will allow or do under pressure and the reason why is because there is very little underlying true spirituality that would cause a change and many of them ignore their own religions as a result because they ignore the basic tenets of truth as a result in their own religion because they want to, because it requires too much of them to do anything different than what they're currently doing. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So I feel that's a big problem on the planet. We need to... Yeah, we, if, if, imagine if we just all gave up any form of religion for a moment and we all just decided that individually we were just going to be more loving and always truthful in our day-to-day -day life. Right? Just imagine we all did that. We would automatically be all more truly spiritual. Automatically. We wouldn't need a priest to tell us what to do. We wouldn't need a doctrine. We wouldn't need a faith. We wouldn't need any of those things to do this. Uh, we are totally capable of doing this. As a society, we are to and individually, we are totally capable of doing this. It's just whether we want it badly enough or not. And for many of us, we don't want it badly enough, and that's why we don't do it. And it's got nothing to do with the religion that we're in or, or the way of life we've embraced a lot of times. It's got everything to do with the fact that we are basically just a bit too selfish to change. We don't want to embrace love. And that, that is a mark of pseudo-spirituality. Pseudo-spirituality is religious movements and groups that have been set up specifically to aid us holding on to those emotions, to help us avoid becoming more loving and becoming more truthful in our day-to-day -day life. And, but often at the same time promoting the facade of doing that. And that, so that we to make me out is that the key thing. It, yeah. Yeah. it helps us avoid even more doing that, doesn't it? The, if we just sat with the truth of, I don't actually want to change, uh, I don't actually want to be more loving or truthful, <laughs> Which we're yeah, actually... We're allowed to do. Yeah, but we'd actually be more closer to the truth of our own selfishness and the, our own fear yeah, and than we are. Ironically, being even more spiritual. Exactly. <laughs> than we are when we say, okay, I don't really want to change at a real level. I'm pretty afraid of that or it's just going to feel uncomfortable. But I don't want to admit that to myself. So I or to will, anyone else. Or to anyone else. <laughs> um, I will engage in this other thing that helps me like fill the void mm. in, and feel like I'm actually an okay person. Or so my mum wants loving. me to go to church yeah. Sunday, so I go to church Sunday. Yeah. To please mum. But I, I'm not going to church Sunday because, because I actually feel like I believe in it or that I want to practice it or any of those kind of things. I just go because I want, I want somebody else's approval. And those kind of things we've got to give up if we want to be truly spiritual. But sometimes, even... sometimes the most down-to-earth bloke that I meet in Australia is far more truly spiritual yeah. than, than the most like, religious priests that I meet. Yeah. Because, because the average bloke in Australia, blokey guy in Australia is often more truthful with me, more honest with me, more direct with me, more truthful about his true feelings about every single thing. He's a, he's a, he's a joy to speak with many times in comparison to a man who's trying, holding on to the facade, holding on to his image, holding on to this idea that he has about God that is totally incorrect and obviously false and, uh, and illogical to hold on to. And often I find them quite, quite hard to, di to discuss any matter with as a result because you're not getting the real them, ever. Mm. You're just getting a facade for many. 
and, and this is where we need to start seeing... And, and I don't know about the majority of you, but if you think about it, the majority of you feel attracted to people who are just real with you, don't you, generally? You like the people who are just real, down-to-earth, basic people, they're the people who you connect with. Why? Because they are more truly spiritual people than, than the person who puts on a facade and tries to make out things are better than they are and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what's the time? Can we just ask the time? Sure. It's 11.30, right? Okay. Do I just have a question? Do I? Yeah. I do. Are there similar um, pseudo-spiritual groups in the spirit world as there are on earth or is it harder to maintain it? these beliefs in the spirit world? No, it's very, very easy to maintain in the spirit world if you want to, just like it is here on earth. So there are many groups in the spirit world who, uh, who believe themselves to be truly spiritual. I've had uh, many of these groups come and have a chat with me at some point. There was one group I, I'd probably like to relate, and that is, uh, this was what it would have been uh, sort of five years or four years ago now. Um, I had a group of, of Catholic priests come and speak with me only because they want me killed. <laughs> they, 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 that's the only reason why they wanted to come and speak with me. And they come and spoke with me about all the bad things that I'm doing and wrong things that I'm doing and, uh, and that they wanted me to die and they, would, they told me they were going to try to arrange that uh, from the spirit world. And, um, and I started talking to them about the Bible and the belief systems. Now in the Bible, which contain much about love and not attacking your fellow man and not wanting your fellow man to die and so forth. And they became enraged very, very quickly and they would not accept that uh, they w were just involved in a, in, a, in a movement in the spirit world that just wanted to, to control people on earth. And, uh, and as a result, in the discussion, they finished up just leaving the discussion, like they just went because they couldn't cope with the discussion any further. Now, that's a, they were, many of them uh, were popes from, from many centuries ago um, and, and many bishops and other, and other priests who came to speak. There was a group of one and a half million of them who came to speak that day uh, and they all had the same opinion. And the, the opinion was that uh, if they could kill some people on earth who, who disagree with their religion, that the world would be better off. That was their opinion. Obviously a very unloving position and obviously totally out of harmony with true spirituality, but, but that's what they felt. At least they were truthful about it, which, mm. was, which was great. <laughs> yeah. but, but aside from that, they had no desire to change. Yeah. Behind you. May I add a point? Just a bit closer. May I add a point? Sure. Preached but not practised. Exactly. That's, many times, uh, many of the people who are involved in pseudo-spirituality do preach things that they personally do not practice. Mm. And, um, and that is also a good, uh, good sign. Yeah, that's right. So if you're going to believe in the Bible, then practice it fully. And if you practice it fully, you would never go to war. Mm. Like if you practice the Bible fully, you would never go to war. If you practice the Bible fully, you would never even attack another person. In fact, if you practice my words in the first century which are recorded in the Bible about anger, you would never even get angry with another person if you really, if you really did it. I've had some emails that come from Christian people who are just swearing at me and angry with me because of my claim that I'm Jesus. And I write back to them, but your Jesus said in this verse in the Bible that even your anger is a sin. <laughs> Right? So there's a scripture in the Bible in Matthew that talks about how anger, how anger should be dealt with and, uh, and, it, and it actually discusses it as a sin against another person. And, uh, and yeah, usually I just get more <laughs> anger back as, as a normal response. But that is a demonstration of how that particular individual is only involved in pseudo-spirituality. Because if they were involved in true spirituality, they wouldn't engage anger in that manner. Yep. Okay, when, let's. Well, I was wondering if it's been two hours now uh, since we began. Yeah, Can do we you think we could finish our list and then we're kind of. Well, let's a finish nice this segue. list and yeah. then what we'll do perhaps is have a break for yeah. uh, maybe. It's probably logical to have a break for an hour so that everyone. There's no place to eat in here, is there? So no. we need to eat outside somewhere. Yeah. Um, so if we have a break for an hour and then we proceed yeah. Yeah, with yeah. the rest of it. So let's okay. finish off. Okay, we've the covered lots of them. Yeah. But. Um, 
couple here that we could probably group together, requires payment for services... Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> ..and promotes self and ownership of knowledge. Yeah, requires payment for services. And uh, what was the other one, Alan? Promotes self and ownership of knowledge. Self and ownership. Of knowledge. Payment for services is an interesting one, isn't it? Like, how many religions do this and how many forms of uh, spirituality do this where you've got to have a lot of money before you can be involved with it. Um, the truth is free. God gave the truth for free. The truth is not, not only free, it sets you free. Mm. That's the irony of truth. And so everything should be available for free and uh, as a gift. Mm. You know, if we want to contribute to, the, to it, then fine, it's up to you. But it should be available as a gift. So all of these religions that pass a collection plate around expecting you to donate, they're out of harmony with love and truth. They are, they are involved in a form of pseudo-spirituality. Yeah, and I'm thinking about in the old days um, where you could buy one of your relatives out, out of, purgatory of purgatory and all those kinds of yeah, things. And yeah. you still can. Can you? Yeah. <laughs> I thought that... Yeah, in many countries it's past. still happening wow. where you can buy yep, your, your out of purgatory. Luther formed his whole religion, the Lutheran religion, because he observed the Catholic religion fleecing the flock so much that he actually set up another religion, he thought at the time, that didn't fleece the flock so yeah. much and that didn't buy its way into different forms of spirituality. Yeah. Yeah. So even, even the reformists uh, who were involved in the reformation of the Christian church were all really concerned about the fact that uh, their forms of spirituality required payment for services. But if you look at it even today, the average church still pays for a wedding. you still got to pay for a wedding, right. a wedding service, for example. Uh, why that is the case is <laughs> anybody's guess. You've still got to pay for funeral services, yeah. generally. Uh, why that's the case, again, yeah. is anybody's guess. And these are all basically even basic things that happen to a person's life, and yet you've still got to pay for them. Now, if the church was truly confident in its own truth... It would just allow people to do whatever they wanted um, with regard to donations and they'd have enough money to survive. Yeah. Um, the problem is, is that uh, many forms of religion and many forms of spiritual movements, if you look at a lot of the New Age uh, movements too, you have people travelling around and they charge, like in a day like today, they'd charge like $500 for mm -hmm. two days or something like that. And only the people with that kind of money could come along to a session. Yeah. Um, and that, that is obviously out of harmony with love and truth and it's also out of harmony with true spirituality. Yeah. Thank you, AJ and Mary. Just on that point, does that cover the point where um, are doing good acts to get into heaven as well? So it's not just exactly. physical monetary. Like I, I've had that belief, you know, well, if you're a good girl, you earn your place yeah. in heaven. Yeah, and that, and that being a good girl and a good boy type thing, um, is, is very much related to the same, same kind of feeling, which is you can earn your way. This is the trouble with requiring payment for services is sooner or later people think that they can earn their way into things, which is also not true. So, yeah, I feel it's a big issue in most religious uh, forms and most spiritual forms that we see on the planet. And, and, in fact, most people who believe they're spiritual, one of the first things you can do is give up the request for the payment of your service and then see how spiritual you are. <laughs> Does that make sense? Because a lot of times you get nothing then and you start worrying then. <laughs> and so it's a great way of confronting some emotion inside of us where we often always want payment, always want payment, always want payment for our service and therefore we start thinking we've always got to give payment and we don't. The reality is if the truth appeals to the heart of an individual, they will want to support it. That's the reality. If it doesn't, then they won't want to. So let them, let them do whatever they decide. True spirituality will let them do what they decide. Pseudo-spirituality will try to force them into a position. And, and just further on that, I don't know if you're going to cover it within the sexuality talk, um, but forced morality 
like I've been involved in a lot of spiritual movements and I've gone from enforced morality, yes. which is sort of like <laughs> saying to people, um, don't eat chocolate, don't eat chocolate, and that's all you can think about, yeah, particularly yeah. with <laughs> regards to sex. With sex, yeah. Um, and then there's the, the New Age movement where it's all good, it's all just it's sharing almost forced of immorality. It's forced <laughs> immorality. Yeah. So, yeah. could you? Are you going to expand on we that morality be. concept later? Yes, yeah. we are. And we we find this is a very interesting subject because in when we're in England, there was a, one of our talks we gave. There were a third of the audience was involved in some uh, in what I would classify as forced immorality. Um, and and they were accepting that as spiritual development. And in fact. They, whenever a person who was a part of that movement felt there was something wrong, the others in that movement would say, no, you just can't have sex with everybody here because you've got a problem. Right? So there was a forced immorality. So, and a so, shaming. And, and a shaming, shaming of yeah. the person for not being immoral. Mm. <laughs> and so, so you have both. You have many religions trying to force morality and then you have also many, many forms of movements trying to force immorality. And either one is obviously a, a, a sign of pseudo-spirituality. Yeah. 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 But we'll talk about that in a lot more detail after the break. We feel it's a major area that demonstrates uh, a lack of understanding of even the human body, uh, mm -hmm. let alone life generally. Yeah. 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 Yep. If we look at this one here too... Um, that promotes the ownership of knowledge. You see, people today are very protective about knowledge. Have you noticed that? Like, we have all these intellectual property rights and all these kind of things. If a person is truly spiritual, they would share their knowledge willingly and openly without cost and without worry about other people and how they're going to treat that knowledge. Does that make sense? Now, if you look at what actually happens... Many people on earth who create spiritual forms of movement do not do that. They don't share their knowledge willingly and openly. Before uh, my, I started travelling around, I worked in an industry, the computer industry, as a systems analyst, programmer and engineer. And what I found was many of my colleagues refused to share any knowledge they had ever gathered because they viewed it as their only source of income. Whereas when I was with a client, I would share everything I knew. Now, ironically, those people who shared less of their knowledge earned less money than I did. And the reason why that was was because most of my clients realised that my ability to share the knowledge meant that they eventually could learn to do it themselves and so they'd be willing to pay me more money <laughs> as a result because they would eventually be able to learn to do something themselves and therefore not need me at all. And so I loved it when a, when a um, client chose to take that route. So instead of being reliant on me, they learnt to be self-reliant. And as a result of that, I was well known for doing that and therefore could charge more money because I was in higher demand. Isn't that ironic? Mm. The very thing that caused them to be afraid was the very thing that also limited their income. And really, and though, part of this. you did that as a quality of love, that love would always seek to empower the other person in themselves. Always, and always. even if I'm in business or wherever I am. Yeah. Like if, if I was in a, a business where I was making beautiful dishes, you know, and, and people come along and ask me for the, re, for the recipe, recipe, I would yeah. give it to them because yeah. I would think... Of course, I can make different recipes. Like yes. I, I'm, a, I'm an infinite creator here. I can make all <laughs> sorts of things. And uh, I wouldn't be holding on to the particular thing that I, I've created. It, because whenever you hold on, most people don't realise that when you're holding on, it's driven by fear of some kind, which is an indication that the truth about love has not yet touched yeah. your heart. Our hearts, mm. yeah. Mm. Yeah. All right, um, a few more. We've got gratifies the animal here. Uh, yes. very heavy sounding. Gratifies the animal. So we're not talking about our pets here? No. So <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about, the fact is that we have a physical body. Let's call that the animal form part, that's part of us as a human. Uh, it has its own urges and needs and desires and so forth. Now, 
often forms of religion are created just to satisfy those urges and needs and desires. So, for example, the sexual desires that we have. But that's not the only example. There's also... Because our sexual desires were created in a pure way to be used in a pure way, and we'll talk about that later. But we also have emotions in us that are a part of the animal in the sense that, uh, that we just feel enraged at times and we want to kill in that place. Mm. And, and often we see forms of religion creating outlets for people to gratify the animal nature. So in other words, you can't kill all your friends, but you can certainly kill anybody who's of a different religion than you. Yeah. Right? Now that's an example of a religious teaching that gratifies the animal, that gratifies this sort of uncontrolled animalistic behaviour, which is obviously unloving uh, and therefore, therefore not truly spiritual. But, but we often see this happening where um, religious forms do gratify the, that part of ourselves. We need to uh, understand that this animal part of ourselves uh, is a part of ourselves and, and it has been crea created completely in harmony with love and can be used completely in harmony with love. But obviously when we're killing and harming other people, uh, raping other people and all these other things that we, we may finish up doing or even potentially taking? doing. Is it just taking for our own Even physical, taking, being um, selfish with other people. Yeah. That's all a yeah. part of just gratifying this nature without actually using out the love to determine what is the appropriate action mm -hmm. that we should take here. Mm -hmm. mm. Louisa, you just need to be careful as you walk past the camera. Thanks, Sam. Can you, um, would you give a positive example of animal nature? Yeah, sexuality is another positive part of it. Like the reality is God created uh, you with a vagina and me with a <laughs> penis and, and uh, all women with a vagina and all men with a penis. Uh, that is generally the case, right? <laughs> and uh, as a result of that, um, God obviously had an intention that we, that we use sexuality in a joyful manner to, to enhance our life. That is a part of, part of gratifying that part of our nature. However, uh, the, it has to be in harmony with the principles of love. So when we get out of harmony with the principles of love with it, now we're now gratifying our nature but harming ourselves or harming another. And that's a very, very different part of, our, of ourselves that does that. It's an injured part of ourselves that's not part of what was originally created. Yeah. yeah. So can we also relate that to things like um, taste and eating? And is yes. that a part of our animal nature? Like this yes, joy so that we have at tasty food. Do all of you enjoy tasty food? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, if you eat to obesity, can you see that that is gratifying the animal? Yeah. Because in the end you gratify the animal, but you get larger and larger and larger and larger and larger. And eventually you get so large that you can't even move. There are some people who have become that large, right? Now, if you get that large, it's an indication you're gratifying the animal without any form of control over the behaviour. So this is where we see, again, this, there are things that God has given us as gifts. We can use every one of these gifts in a manner that it totally enhances our life completely, or we can use it as, a, as something that can destroy us even. Many people have died from sexual venereal diseases as a result of gratifying the animal without any form of control. And um, when you say control, I guess what I think about is there's two ways we can control. Mm -hmm. There's like the intellectual control and sort of what uh, yeah, Monica and that's was speaking not the way about I'm earlier. Yeah. No, but then love can control our actions, can't exactly. it? Exactly. So yeah. if, if we were truly loving and felt the love in our heart... We, we could not engage sexually with hundreds of different partners mm -hmm. because we understand that there are diseases that result from such a thing and also hurt feelings that result from such a thing. And we would need to address those mm -hmm. particular things. Once we become in harmony with love, we will less likely be involved in those kind of behaviours. It's the same with stealing and it's the same with smoking. It's the same with all other forms of behaviour we can engage in that have a form of unlovingness in them. So like with smoking, we're being unloving to ourselves, we're being unloving to our neighbour. If we develop in love further, we will eventually not smoke. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't say to everyone, oh, nobody who's a smoker should be here. Yeah. Because that would be separating, which would also be a form of pseudo-spirituality. Yeah. We would embrace everybody who's, in, who's doing whatever they're doing, yeah. but what we would do is we would help them come to terms with the fact that certain things are out of harmony with love 
and certain things are gratifying their animal nature and not gratifying the soul. They're, they're not helping the soul. And what you're saying here is there's certain spiritual movements that actually are focused definitely on just gratifying the, definitely. the animal. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And, uh, and many spiritual movements who do that um, have, have finished up leading to suicide of groups of people, have finished mm. up leaving, leading to mass orgies, leading to all sorts of forms of behaviour over the, over the last thousands of years since religion has ever been established. And they are all proving that it hasn't touched their heart yet. Yeah. That's all yeah. they're proving. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I think we've covered everything else. There's just um, four major statements that you've made at the end. Mm -hmm. And that um, pseudo-spirituality promotes the appearance of love but fails under pressure. And you've spoken about that. Yes. Yeah. So in other words, it, it makes everything look loving on the outside. But when a bit of pressure comes along, like a war, for example, or some other kind of pressure that's either external in nature or internal to the person's life, as soon as the pressure comes, love disappears. Yes. And yep. that's an indication of pseudo-spirituality. Mm -hmm. yeah. Promotes the appearance of truth, but lies become exposed when investigated. Yes. So in other words, on the outward side, it looks like it's all truthful. But when you start involving the people with truth inside the movement itself, then everybody starts, you know... Uh, it all disintegrates in terms of you start seeing lies and people lying to each other and so forth. Uh, it's, true spirituality will always promote the truth and the people living in true, a truly spiritual state would always be living in the truth. Yeah. yeah, okay. And promotes the appearance of humility while fostering pride and arrogance. Which yeah, so in other words, we all make out that we're all modest and humble by putting on a facade... But the reality is none of us are willing to look at ourselves and, and truly see our true nature. Yeah. Whereas uh, if we're truly sp spiritual, we will want to see our true nature. We'll, be, we'll, be, we'll have joy when another person uh, sees their true nature, no matter how bad it might look at the, at the first look. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll actually support them in their I examination of themselves and, and of society generally. And that's really the last point that we had, that, um, that we need to be honest with ourselves, that um, to progress towards God, we must see what's really happening, not what we want to be happening. Yes. And um, pseudo-spirituality leads us to be misled, basically. Yes. It causes us to be misled spiritually. Yes, yeah. so, you know, when we, when we are focused on only on what we want spirituality to be, we are going to be seduced by our own emotional condition and our own intellectual beliefs. Uh, what we want with true spirituality, what we want is to be confronted, not to be support, yeah. supported necessarily. I mean, supported in terms of a, a loving support, but we need to be emotionally confronted and intellectually confronted because if we're going to, as a society, get into a more loving state and even a more developed state, mm -hmm. we have to let go of what we currently have and embrace new technologies and new feelings and new emotions and new beliefs. We have to do that if we're going to progress as an entire society. And we can only do that if we are willing to give away the old yes. or at least build on the old. Yeah. Yeah. So what we'd like to do now is just have a break for an hour. Is that all right with everyone? And uh, uh, so what time does that make it come back about? One. And uh, we'll get started on discussing the sexual side of it and the spirit side of, of this discussion. And please, if you've got any questions that come up during the break, don't feel free to write them down and, uh, and, and ask. ask them during the uh, I think David mentioned that there's um, some good cafes nearby that might... Catered to the vegans and vegetarians, yeah? Yes. That way? Yeah. Cool. Yep. Thank so, you. So they are along what street, David? Oxford, Oxford Street? Yeah. Yep. No worries. Okay, we'll meet you in an hour's time. No worries.